Bushido, The Soul of Japan, by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 1. Bushido as an Ethical System Chivalry is a flower no less indigenous to the soil of Japan than its emblem, the cherry blossom, nor is it a dried-up specimen of an antique virtue preserved in the herbarium of our history. It is still a living object of power and beauty among us, and if it assumes no tangible shape or form, it not the less sends the moral atmosphere and makes us aware that we are still under its potent spell. The conditions of society which brought it forth and nourished it have long disappeared, but as those far-off stars which once were and are not still continue to shed their rays upon us, so the light of chivalry, which was a child of feudalism, still illuminates our moral path, surviving its mother institution. It is a pleasure to me to reflect upon this subject in the language of Burke, who uttered the well-known touching eulogy over the neglected buyer of its European prototype. It argues a sad defect of information concerning the Far East, when so erudite a scholar as Dr. George Miller did not hesitate to affirm that chivalry or any other similar institution has never existed either among the nations of antiquity or among the modern Orientals. Such ignorance, however, is amply excusable, as the third edition of the good doctor's work appeared the same year that Commodore Perry was knocking at the portals of our exclusivism. More than a decade later, about the time that our feudalism was in the last throes of existence, Karl Marx, writing his Capital, called the attention of his readers to the peculiar advantage of studying the social and political institutions of feudalism, as then to be seen in living form only in Japan. I would likewise invite the Western historical and ethical student to the study of chivalry in the Japan of the present. Enticing as is a historical disquisition on the comparison between European and Japanese feudalism and chivalry, it is not the purpose of this paper to enter into it at length. My attempt is rather to relate, firstly, the origin and sources of our chivalry, secondly, its character and teaching, thirdly, its influence among the masses, and, fourthly, the continuity and permanence of its influence. Of these several points, the first will be only brief and cursory, or else I should have to take my readers into the devious paths of our national history. The second will be dwelt upon at greater length, as being most likely to interest students of international ethics and comparative ethology in our ways of thought and action, and the rest will be dealt with as corollaries. The Japanese word which I have roughly rendered chivalry is, in the original, more expressive than horsemanship. Bushi do means literally military night ways, the ways which fighting nobles should observe in their daily life as well as in their vocation, in a word, the precepts of knighthood, the noblesse oblige of the warrior class. Having thus given its literal significance, I may be allowed henceforth to use the word in the original. The use of the original term is also advisable for this reason, that a teaching so circumscribed and unique, engendered as cast of mind and character so peculiar, so local, must wear the badge of its singularity on its face. Then, some words have a national timbre so expressive of race characteristics, that the best of translators can do them but scant justice, not to say positive injustice and grievance. Who can improve by translation what the German Gemüt signifies, or who does not feel the difference between the two words verbally so closely allied as the English gentleman and the French gentilhomme? Bushido, then, is the code of moral principles which the knights were required or instructed to observe. 
It is not a written code. At best it consists of a few maxims handed down from mouth to mouth, or coming from the pen of some well-known warrior or servant. More frequently it is a code unuttered and unwritten, possessing all the more the powerful sanction of veritable deed, and of a law written on the fleshly tablets of the heart. It was founded not on the creation of one brain, however able, or on the life of a single personage, however renowned. It was an organic growth of decades and centuries of military career. It, perhaps, fills the same position in the history of ethics that the English Constitution does in political history. Yet it has had nothing to compare with the Magna Charta or the Habeas Corpus Act. True, early in the 17th century military statutes, Buke Hato, were promulgated, but their thirteen short articles were taken up mostly with marriages, castles, leagues, etc., and didactic regulations were but meagerly touched upon. We cannot, therefore, point out any definite time and place and say, here is its fountainhead. Only as it attains consciousness in the feudal age, its origin in respect to time may be identified with feudalism. But feudalism itself is woven of many threads, and Bushido shares its intricate nature. As in England, the political institutions of feudalism may be said to date from the Norman conquest, so we may say that in Japan its rise was simultaneous with the ascendancy of Yoritomo late in the 12th century. As, however, in England, we find the social elements of feudalism far back in the period previous to William the Conqueror, so, too, the germs of feudalism in Japan had been long existent before the period I have mentioned. Again, in Japan as in Europe, when feudalism was formally inaugurated, the professional class of warriors naturally came into prominence. These were known as samurai, meaning literally, like the old English knicht, necht, knight, guards or attendants, resembling in character the solduri, whom Caesar mentioned as existing in Aquitania, or the comitati, who, according to Tacitus, followed Germanic chiefs in his time, or, to take a still later parallel, the milites medii that one reads about in the history of medieval Europe. A cynical Japanese word, bu ke, or bu shi, fighting knights, was also adopted in common use. They were a privileged class and must originally have been a rough breed who made fighting their vocation. This class was naturally recruited in a long period of constant warfare from the manliest and the most adventurous, and all the while the process of elimination went on, the timid and the feeble being sorted out, and only a rude race all masculine with brutish strength, to borrow Emerson's phrase, surviving to form families and the ranks of the samurai, coming to profess great honor and great privileges, and correspondingly great responsibilities, they soon felt the need of a common standard of behavior, especially as they were always on a belligerent footing and belonged to different clans. Just as physicians limit competition among themselves by professional courtesy, just as lawyers sit in courts of honor in cases of violated etiquette, so must also warriors possess some resort for final judgment on their misdemeanors. Fair play in fight! What fertile germs of morality lie in this primitive sense of savagery in childhood? Is it not the root of all military and civic virtues? We smile, as if we had outgrown it, at the boyish desire of the small Britisher, Tom Brown, to leave behind him the name of a fellow who never bullied a little boy or turned his back on a big one. And yet, who does not know that this desire is the cornerstone on which moral structures of mighty dimensions can be reared? May I not go even so far as to say that the gentlest and most peace-loving of religions endorses this aspiration? 
This desire of Tom's is the basis on which the greatness of England is largely built, and it will not take us long to discover that Bushido does not stand on a lesser pedestal. If fighting in itself, be it offensive or defensive, is, as Quakers rightly testify, brutal and wrong, we can still say with Lessing, we know from what failings our virtue springs. Sneaks and cowards are epithets of the worst opprobrium to healthy, simple natures. Childhood begins life with these notions, and knighthood also, but, as life grows larger and its relations many-sided, the early faith seeks sanction from higher authority and more rational sources for its own justification, satisfaction, and development. If military interests had operated alone, without higher moral support, how far short of chivalry would the ideal of knighthood have fallen? In Europe, Christianity, interpreted with concessions convenient to chivalry, infused it nevertheless with spiritual data. Religion, war, and glory were the three souls of a perfect Christian knight, says Lamartine. End of chapter 1「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 2 – Sources of Bushido In Japan there were several sources of Bushido, of which I may begin with Buddhism. It furnished a sense of calm trust in faith, a quiet submission to the inevitable, that stoic composure in sight of danger or calamity, that disdain of life and friendliness with death. A foremost teacher of swordmanship, when he saw his pupil master the utmost of his art, told him, Beyond this my instruction must give way to Zen teaching. Zen is the Japanese equivalent for the dhyana, which represents human effort to reach through meditation zones of thought beyond the range of verbal expression. Its method is contemplation, and its purport, as far as I understand it, to be convinced of a principle that underlies all phenomena, and, if it can, of the absolute itself, and thus to put oneself in harmony with this absolute. Thus defined, the teaching was more than the dogma of a sect, and whoever attains to the perception of the absolute raises himself above mundane things and awakes to a new heaven and a new earth. What Buddhism failed to give, Shintoism offered in abundance. Such loyalty to the sovereign, such reverence for ancestral memory, and such filial piety as are not taught by any other creed, were inculcated by the Shinto doctrines, imparting passivity to the otherwise arrogant character of the samurai. Shinto theology has no place for the dogma of original sin. On the contrary, it believes in the innate goodness and godlike purity of the human soul, adoring it as the adytum from which divine oracles are proclaimed. Everybody has observed that the Shinto shrines are conspicuously devoid of objects and instruments of worship, and that a plain mirror hung in the sanctuary forms the essential part of its furnishing. The presence of this article is easy to explain. It typifies the human heart, which, when perfectly placid and clear, reflects the very image of the deity. When you stand, therefore, in front of the shrine to worship, you see your own image reflected on its shining surface and the act of worship is tantamount to the old Delphic injunction, Know thyself. But self-knowledge does not imply, either in the Greek or Japanese teaching, knowledge of the physical part of man, not his anatomy or his psychophysics. Knowledge was to be of a moral kind, the introspection of our moral nature. Mommsen, comparing the Greek and the Roman, says that when the former worshipped, he raised his eyes to heaven, for his prayer was contemplation, while the latter veiled his head, for his was reflection. Our reflection brought into prominence not so much the moral as the national consciousness of the individual. 
its nature worship endeared the country to our inmost souls while its ancestor worship tracing from lineage to lineage made the imperial family the fountainhead of the whole nation to us the country is more than land and soil from which to mine gold or to reap grain it is the sacred abode of the gods the spirits of our forefathers to us the emperor is more than the arch constable of a rechtsstaat or even the patron of a kulturstaat he is bodily representative of heaven on earth blending in his person its power and its mercy if what mr butmi says is true of english royalty that it is not only the image of authority but the author and symbol of national unity as i believe it to be doubly and trebly may this be affirmed of royalty in japan the tenets of shintoism cover the two predominating features of the emotional life of our race patriotism and loyalty arthur may knapp in feudal and modern japan very truly says in hebrew literature it is often difficult to tell whether the writer is speaking of god or of the commonwealth of heaven or of jerusalem of the messiah or of the nation itself a similar confusion may be noticed in the nomenclature of our national faith i said confusion because it will be so deemed by a logical intellect on account of its verbal ambiguity still being a framework of national instinct and race feelings shintoism never pretends to a systematic philosophy or a rational theology this religion or is it not more correct to say the race emotions which this religion expressed thoroughly imbued bushido with loyalty to the sovereign and love of country these acted more as impulses than as doctrines for shintoism unlike the medieval christian church prescribed to its votaries scarcely any credenda furnishing them at the same time with agenda of a straightforward and simple type as to strictly ethical doctrines the teachings of confucius were the most prolific source of bushido his enunciation of the five moral relations between master and servant the governing and the governed father and son husband and wife older and younger brother and between friend and friend was but a confirmation of what the race instinct had recognized before his writings were introduced from china the calm benignant and worldly wise character of his politico-ethical precepts was particularly well suited to the samurai who formed the ruling class his aristocratic and conservative tone was well adapted to the requirements of these warrior statesmen next to confucius mencius exercised an immense authority over bushido his forcible and often quite democratic theories were exceedingly taking to sympathetic natures and they were even thought dangerous to and subversive of the existing social order hence his works were for a long time under censure still the words of this mastermind found permanent lodgment in the heart of the samurai the writings of confucius and mencius formed the principal textbooks for youths and the highest authority in discussion among the old a mere acquaintance with the classics of these two sages was held however in no high esteem a common proverb ridicules one who has only an intellectual knowledge of confucius as a man ever studious but ignorant of analects a typical samurai calls a literary savant a book-smelling sot another compares learning to an ill-smelling vegetable that must be boiled and boiled before it is fit for use a man who has read a little smells a little pedantic and a man who has read much smells yet more so both are alike unpleasant the writer meant thereby that knowledge becomes really such only when it is assimilated in the mind of the learner and shows in his character an intellectual specialist was considered a machine intellect itself was considered subordinate to ethical emotion man and the universe were conceived to be alike spiritual and ethical bushido could not accept the judgment of huxley that the cosmic process was unmoral 
Bushido made light of knowledge as such. It was not pursued as an end in itself, but as a means to the attainment of wisdom. Hence, he who stopped short of this end was regarded no higher than a convenient machine, which could turn out poems and maxims at bidding. Thus, knowledge was conceived as identical with its practical application in life, and the Socratic doctrine found its greatest exponent in the Chinese philosopher Wan Yang Ming, who never wearies of repeating, to know and to act are one and the same. I beg leave for a moment's digression while I am on this subject, inasmuch as some of the noblest types of Bushi were strongly influenced by the teachings of this sage. Western readers will easily recognize in his writings many parallels to the New Testament. Making allowance for the terms peculiar to either teaching, the passage, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you conveys a thought that may be found on almost any page of one young Ming. A Japanese disciple, Miwa Shisai, of his says, The Lord of heaven and earth, of all living beings, dwelling in the heart of men, becomes his mind, Kokoro. Hence, a mind is a living thing and is ever luminous. And again, The spiritual light of our essential being is pure, and is not affected by the will of man. Spontaneously springing up in our mind, it shows what is right and wrong. It is then called conscience. It is even the light that proceedeth from the God of heaven. How very much do these words sound like some passages from Isaac Pennington or other philosophic mystics. I am inclined to think that the Japanese mind, as expressed in the simple tenets of the Shinto religion, was particularly open to the reception of Yang Ming's precepts. He carried his doctrine of the infallibility of conscience to extreme transcendentalism, attributing to it the faculty to perceive not only the distinction between right and wrong, but also the nature of psychical facts and physical phenomena. He went as far as, if not farther than, Berkeley and Fichte, in idealism denying the existence of things outside of human ken. If his system had all the logical errors charged to solipsism, it had all the efficacy of strong conviction and its moral import in developing individuality of character and equanimity of temper cannot be gainsaid. Thus, whatever the sources, the essential principles which Bushido imbibed from them and assimilated to itself were few and simple. Few and simple as these were, they were sufficient to furnish a safe conduct of life even through the unsafest days of the most unsettled period of our nation's history. The wholesome, unsophisticated nature of our warrior ancestors derived ample food for their spirit from a sheaf of commonplace and fragmentary teachings, gleaned as it were on the highways and byways of ancient thought, and, stimulated by the demands of the age, formed from these gleanings a new and unique type of manhood. An acute French servant, Monsieur de la Mazelière, thus sums up his impressions of the sixteenth century. Toward the middle of the sixteenth century, all is confusion in Japan, in the government, in society, in the church. But the civil wars, the manners returning to barbarism, the necessity for each to execute justice for himself, these formed men comparable to those Italians of the sixteenth century in whom Taine praises the vigorous initiative, the habit of sudden resolutions and desperate undertakings, the grand capacity to do and to suffer. In Japan as in Italy, the rude manners of the Middle Ages made of man a superb animal, wholly militant and wholly resistant. And this is why the 16th century displays in the highest degree the principal quality of the Japanese race, that great diversity which one finds there between minds, esprits, as well as between temperaments. While in India and even in China, men seem to differ chiefly in degree of energy or intelligence, 
in japan they differ by originality of character as well now individuality is the sign of superior races and of civilizations already developed if we make use of an expression dear to nietzsche we might say that in asia to speak of humanity is to speak of its plains in japan as in europe one represents it above all by its mountains End of chapter 2「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 3 Rectitude or Justice To the pervading characteristics of the men of whom Monsieur de la Mazelière writes, let us now address ourselves. I shall begin with rectitude or justice, the most cogent precept in the code of the samurai. Nothing is more loathsome to him than underhand dealings and crooked undertakings. The conception of rectitude may be erroneous, it may be narrow. A well-known bushi defines it as a power of resolution. Rectitude is the power of deciding upon a certain course of conduct in accordance with reason without wavering, to die when it is right to die, to strike when to strike is right. Another speaks of it in the following terms. Rectitude is the bone that gives firmness and stature. As without bones the head cannot rest on the top of the spine, nor hands move, nor feet stand, so without rectitude neither talent nor learning can make of a human frame a samurai. With it the lack of accomplishments is as nothing. Mencius calls Benvolens man's mind, and rectitude or righteousness his path. How lamentable, he exclaims, is it to neglect the path and not pursue it, to lose the mind and not know to seek it again, but men's fowls and dogs are lost, they know to seek for them again, but they lose their mind and do not know to seek for it. Have we not here, as in a glass darkly, a parable propounded three hundred years later in another clime and by a greater teacher, who called himself the way of righteousness, through whom the lost could be found? But I stray from my point. Righteousness, according to Mencius, is a straight and narrow path which a man ought to take to regain the lost paradise. Even in the latter days of feudalism, when the long continuance of peace brought leisure into the life of the warrior class, and with it dissipations of all kinds and gentle accomplishments, the epithet Gishi, a man of rectitude, was considered superior to any name that signified mastery of learning or art. The forty-seven faithfuls, of whom so much is made in our popular education, are known in common parlance as the forty-seven Gishi. In times when cunning artifice was liable to pass for military tact and downright falsehood for ruse de guerre, this manly virtue, frank and honest, was a jewel that shone the brightest and was most highly praised. Rectitude is a twin brother to valor, another martial virtue. But before proceeding to speak of valor, let me linger a little while on what I may term a derivation from rectitude, which, at first deviating slightly from its original, became more and more removed from it, until its meaning was perverted in the popular acceptance. I speak of giri, literally the right reason, but which came in time to mean a vague sense of duty which public opinion expected an incumbent to fulfill. In its original and unalloyed sense, it meant duty, pure and simple. Hence, we speak of the giri we owe to parents, to superiors, to inferiors, to society at large, and so forth. In these instances, giri is duty. For what else is duty than what right reason demands and commands us to do? Should not right reason be our categorical imperative? Giri primarily meant no more than duty, and I dare say its etymology was derived from the fact that in our conduct, say to our parents, though love should be the only motive, lack in that there must be some other authority to enforce filial piety, 
and they formulated this authority in Giri. Very rightly did they formulate this authority, Giri, since if love does not rush to deeds of virtue, recourse must be had to man's intellect, and his reason must be quickened to convince him of the necessity of acting aright. The same is true of any other moral obligation. The instant duty becomes onerous. Right reason steps in to prevent our shirking it. Giri, thus understood, is a severe taskmaster, with a birch rod in his hand to make sluggards perform their part. It is a secondary power in ethics. As a motive, it is infinitely inferior to the Christian doctrine of love, which should be the law. I deem it a product of the conditions of an artificial society, of a society in which accident of birth and unmerited favor constituted class distinctions, in which the family was the social unit, in which seniority of age was of more account than superiority of talents, in which natural affections had often to succumb before arbitrary man-made customs. Because of this very artificiality, Giri in time degenerated into a vague sense of propriety called upon to explain this and sanction that, as, for example, why a mother must, if need be, sacrifice all her other children in order to save the firstborn, or why a daughter must sell her chastity to get funds to pay for the father's dissipation, and the like. Starting as right reason, Giri has, in my opinion, often stooped to casuistry. It has even degenerated into cowardly fear of censure. I might say of Giri what Scott wrote of patriotism, that, as it is the fairest, so it is often the most suspicious, mask of other feelings. Carried beyond or below right reason, Giri became a monstrous misnomer. It harbored under its wings every sort of sophistry and hypocrisy. It might easily have been turned into a nest of cowardice, if Bushido had not a keen and correct sense of courage, the spirit of daring and bearing, to the consideration of which we shall now return. End of chapter 3『Bushido, the Soul of Japan』by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 4 Courage, the Spirit of Daring and Bearing Courage was scarcely deemed worthy to be counted among virtues, unless it was exercised in the cause of righteousness. In his Analects, Confucius defines courage by explaining, as is often his wont, what its negative is. Perceiving what is right he says, and doing it not argues lack of courage. Put this epigram into a positive statement, and it runs, Courage is doing what is right. To run all kinds of hazards, to jeopardize one's self, to rush into the jaws of death, these are too often identified with valor, and in the profession of arms such rashness of conduct, what Shakespeare calls vela misbegot, is unjustly applauded, but not so in the precepts of knighthood. Death for a cause unworthy of dying for was called a dog's death. To rush into the thick of battle and to be slain in it, says the prince of Mito, is easy enough, and the merest churl is equal to the task, but, he continues, it is true courage to live when it is right to live, and to die only when it is right to die. And yet the prince had not even heard of the name of Plato, who defines courage as the knowledge of things that a man should fear and that he should not fear. A distinction which is made in the West between moral and physical courage has long been recognized among us. What samurai youth has not heard of great valor and the valor of a villain? Valor, fortitude, bravery, fearlessness, courage, being the qualities of soul which appeal most easily to juvenile minds, and which can be trained by exercise and example, were, so to speak, the most popular virtues, early emulated among the youth. Stories of military exploits were repeated almost before boys left their mother's breast. Does a little booby cry for any ache? 
the mother scolds him in this fashion. What a coward to cry for a trifling pain! What will you do when your arm is cut off in battle? What when you are called upon to commit harakiri? We all know the pathetic fortitude of a famished little boy prince of Sendai, who in the drama is made to say to his little page, Seest thou those shiny sparrows in the nest, how their yellow beaks are opened wide, and now see, there comes their mother with worms to feed them, how eagerly and happily the little ones eat. But for a samurai, when his stomach is empty, it is a disgrace to feel hunger. Anecdotes of fortitude and bravery abound in nursery tales, though stories of this kind are not by any means the only method of early imbuing the spirit with daring and fearlessness. Parents, with sternness sometimes verging on cruelty, set their children to tasks that called forth all the pluck that was in them. Bears hurled their cubs down the gorge, they said. Samurai's sons were let down the steep valleys of hardship, and spurred to Sisyphus-like tasks. Occasional deprivation of food or exposure to cold was considered a highly efficacious test for inuring them to endurance. Children of tender age were sent among utter strangers with some message to deliver, were made to rise before the sun and before breakfast attend to their reading exercises, walking to their teacher with bare feet in the cold of winter. They frequently, once or twice a month as on the festival of a god of learning, came together in small groups and passed the night without sleep in reading aloud by turns. Pilgrimages to all sorts of uncanny places, to execution grounds, to graveyards, to houses reputed to be haunted, were favorite pastimes of the young. In the days when decapitation was public, not only were small boys sent to witness the ghastly scene, but they were made to visit alone the place in the darkness of night, and there to leave a mark of their visit on the trunkless head. Does this ultra-Spartan system of drilling the nerves strike the modern pedagogist with horror and doubt, doubt whether the tendency would not be brutalizing, nipping in the bud the tender emotions of the heart? Let us see what other concepts Bushido had of valor. The spiritual aspect of valor is evidenced by composure, calm presence of mind. Tranquility is courage in repose. It is a statical manifestation of valor, as daring deeds are a dynamical. A truly brave man is ever serene, he is never taken by surprise, nothing ruffles the equanimity of his spirit. In the heat of battle he remains cool, in the midst of catastrophes he keeps level his mind. Earthquakes do not shake him, he laughs at storms. We admire him as truly great, who, in the menacing presence of danger or death, retains his self-possession, who, for instance, can compose a poem under impending peril or hum a strain in the face of death. Such indulgence betraying no tremor in the writing or in the voice is taken as an infallible index of a large nature, of what we call a capacious mind, yo yu, which, far from being pressed or crowded, has always room for something more. It passes current among us as a piece of authentic history that as Ota Dokan, the great builder of the castle of Tokyo, was pierced through with a spear, his assassin, knowing the poetical predilection of his victim, accompanied his thrust with this couplet, Ah, how in moments like these our heart doth grudge the light of life! Whereupon the expiring hero, not one whit daunted by the mortal wound in his side, added the lines, had not in hours of peace it learned to lightly look on life. There is even a sportive element in a courageous nature. Things which are serious to ordinary people may be but play to the valiant. Hence, in old warfare, it was not at all rare for the parties to conflict to exchange repartee or to begin a rhetorical contest. Combat was not solely a matter of brute force, it was as well an intellectual engagement. Of such character was the battle fought on the bank of the Koromo River, late in the 11th century. The eastern army routed, its leader, Sadato, took to flight. When the pursuing general pressed him hard and called aloud, 
It is a disgrace for a warrior to show his back to the enemy. Sadato reined his horse. Upon this, the conquering chief shouted an impromptu verse. Torn into shreds is the warp of the cloth. Koromo. Scarcely had the words escaped his lips when the defeated warrior, undismayed, completed the couplet, since age has worn its threads by use. Yoshie, whose bow had all the while been bent, suddenly unstrung it and turned away, leaving his prospective victim to do as he pleased. When asked the reason of this strange behavior, he replied that he could not bear to put to shame one who had kept his presence of mind while hotly pursued by his enemy. The sorrow which overtook Antony and Octavius at the death of Brutus has been the general experience of brave men. Kenshin, who fought for fourteen years with Shingen, when he heard of the latter's death, wept aloud at the loss of the best of enemies. It was this same Kenshin who had set a noble example for all time in his treatment of Shingen, whose provinces lay in a mountainous region quite away from the sea, and who had consequently depended upon the Hojo provinces of the Tokaido for salt. The Hojo prince, wishing to weaken him, although not openly at war with him, had cut off from Shingen all traffic in this important article. Kenshin, hearing of his enemy's dilemma, and able to obtain his salt from the coast of his own dominions, wrote Shingen that in his opinion the Hojo lord had committed a very mean act, and that although he, Kenshin, was at war with him, Shingen, he had ordered his subjects to furnish him with plenty of salt, adding, I do not fight with salt, but with a sword, affording more than a parallel to the words of Camillus. We Romans do not fight with gold, but with iron. Nietzsche spoke for the samurai heart when he wrote, You are to be proud of your enemy, then the success of your enemy is your success also. Indeed, valor and honor alike required that we should own as enemies in war only such as prove worthy of being friends in peace. End of chapter 4「Bushido, the Soul of Japan » by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 5 Benevolence, the Feeling of Distress When valor attains this height, it becomes akin to benevolence, the feeling of distress, love, magnanimity, affection for others, sympathy and pity, which were ever recognized to be supreme virtues, the highest of all the attributes of the human soul. Benevolence was deemed a princely virtue in a twofold sense. Princely among the manifold attributes of a noble spirit, princely as particularly befitting a princely profession. We needed no Shakespeare to feel, though perhaps, like the rest of the world, we needed him to express it, that mercy became a monarch better than his crown, that it was above his sceptred sway. How often both Confucius and Mencius repeat the highest requirement of the ruler of men to consist in benevolence. Confucius would say, Let but a prince cultivate virtue, people will flock to him. With people will come to him lands. Lands will bring forth for him wealth. Wealth will give him the benefit of right uses. Virtue is the root, and wealth an outcome. Again, Never has there been a case of a sovereign loving benevolence and the people not loving righteousness. Mencius follows close at his heels and says, Instances are on record where individuals attained to supreme power in a single state without benevolence, but never have I heard of a whole empire falling into the hands of one who lacked this virtue. Also, it is impossible that any one should become ruler of the people to whom they have not yielded the subjection of their hearts. Both define this indispensable requirement in a ruler by saying, Benevolence. Benevolence is man. Under the regime of feudalism, which could easily be perverted into militarism, it was to benevolence that we owed our deliverance from despotism of the worst kind. 
an utter surrender of life and limb on the part of the governed would have left nothing for the governing but self-will and this has for its natural consequence the growth of that absolutism so often called oriental despotism as though there were no despots of occidental history let it be far from me to uphold despotism of any sort but it is a mistake to identify feudalism with it when frederick the great wrote that kings are the first servants of the state jurists thought rightly that a new era was reached in the development of freedom strangely coinciding in time in the backwoods of northwestern japan yozan of yonezawa made exactly the same declaration showing that feudalism was not all tyranny and oppression a feudal prince although unmindful of owing reciprocal obligations to his vassals felt a higher sense of responsibility to his ancestors and to heaven he was a father to his subjects whom heaven entrusted to his care in a sense not usually assigned to the term bushido accepted and corroborated paternal government paternal also as opposed to the less interested avuncular government uncle sam's to wit the difference between a despotic and a paternal government lies in this that in the one the people obey reluctantly while in the other they do so with that proud submission that dignified obedience that subordination of heart which kept alive even in servitude itself the spirit of exalted freedom the old saying is not entirely false which called the king of england the king of devils because of his subjects often insurrections against and their positions of their princes and which made the french monarch the king of asses because of their infinite taxes and impositions but which gave the title of the king of men to the sovereign of spain because of his subjects willing obedience but enough virtue and absolute power may strike the anglo-saxon mind as terms which it is impossible to harmonize Popiodonostsev has clearly set before us the contrast in the foundations of English and other European communities, namely that these were organized on the basis of common interest, while that was distinguished by a strongly developed independent personality. What this Russian statesman says of the personal dependence of individuals on some social alliance and in the end of ends of the state, among the continental nations of europe and particularly among slavonic peoples is doubly true of the japanese hence not only is a free exercise of monarchical power not felt as heavily by us as in europe but it is generally moderated by parental consideration for the feelings of the people absolutism says bismarck primarily demands in the ruler impartiality honesty devotion to duty energy and inward humility if i may be allowed to make one more quotation on this subject i will cite from the speech of the german emperor at koblenz in which he spoke of kingship by the grace of god with its heavy duties its tremendous responsibility to the creator alone from which no man no minister no parliament can release the monarch we knew benevolence was a tender virtue and mother-like if upright rectitude and stern justice were peculiarly masculine mercy had the gentleness and the persuasiveness of a feminine nature we were warned against indulging in indiscriminate charity without seasoning it with justice and rectitude masamune expressed it well in his oft-quoted aphorism rectitude carried to excess hardens into stiffness benevolence indulged beyond measure sinks into weakness fortunately mercy was not so rare as it was beautiful for it is universally true that the bravest are the tenderest the loving are the daring bushi no nasake the tenderness of a warrior had a sound which appealed at once to whatever was noble in us not that the mercy of a samurai was generically different from the mercy of any other being but because it implied mercy where mercy was not a blind impulse but where it recognized due regard to justice and where mercy did not remain merely a certain state of mind but where it was backed with power to save or kill 
as economists speak of demand as being effectual or ineffectual similarly we may call the mercy of bushi effectual since it implied the power of acting for the good or detriment of the recipient priding themselves as they did in their brute strength and privileges to turn it into account the samurai gave full consent to what mencius taught concerning the power of love benevolence he says brings under its sway whatever hinders its power just as water subdues fire they only doubt the power of water to quench flames who try to extinguish with a cupful a whole burning wagon load of faggots he also says that the feeling of distress is the root of benevolence therefore a benevolent man is ever mindful of those who are suffering and in distress thus did mencius long anticipate adam smith who founds his ethical philosophy on sympathy it is indeed striking how closely the code of knightly honor of one country coincides with that of others in other words how the much abused oriental ideas of morals find their counterparts in the noblest maxims of european literature if the well-known lines he tibi erunt artes pacisque imponere morem pacere subjectis et debellare superbos were shown a japanese gentleman he might readily accuse the mantuan bard of plagiarizing from the literature of his own country benevolence to the weak the downtrodden or the vanquished was ever extolled as peculiarly becoming to a samurai lovers of japanese art must be familiar with the representation of a priest riding backwards on a cow the rider was once a warrior who in his day made his name a byword of terror in the terrible battle of sumano ura eleven eighty four anno domini which was one of the most decisive in our history he overtook an enemy and in single combat had him in the clutch of his gigantic arms now the etiquette of war required that on such occasions no blood should be spilt unless the weaker party proved to be a man of rank or ability equal to that of the stronger the grim combatant would have the name of the man under him but he refusing to make it known his helmet was ruthlessly torn off when the sight of a juvenile face fair and beardless made the astonished knight relax his hold helping the youth to his feet in paternal tones he bade the stripling go off young prince to thy mother's side the sword of kumagaye shall never be tarnished by a drop of thy blood haste and flee o'er yon pass before thy enemies come in sight the young warrior refused to go and begged kumagaye for the honor of both to dispatch him on the spot above the hoary head of the veteran gleams the cold blade which many a time before has sundered the cords of life but his stout heart quails there flashes athwart his mental eye the vision of his own boy who this selfsame day marched to the sound of bugle to try his maiden arms the strong hand of the warrior quivers again he begs his victim to flee for his life finding all his entreaties vain and hearing the approaching steps of his comrades he exclaims if thou art overtaken thou mayest fall at a more ignoble hand than mine o thou infinite receive his soul in an instant the sword flashes in the air and when it falls it is red with adolescent blood when the war is ended we find our soldier returning in triumph but little cares he now for honor or fame he renounces his warlike career shaves his head dons a priestly garb devotes the rest of his days to holy pilgrimage never turning his back to the west where lies the paradise when salvation comes and whither the sun hastes daily for his rest critics may point out flaws in this story which is casuistically vulnerable let it be all the same it shows that tenderness pity and love were traits which adorned the most sanguinary exploits of the samurai it was an old maxim among them that it becometh not the fowler to slay the bird which takes refuge in his bosom this in a large measure explains why the red cross movement considered peculiarly christian so readily found a firm footing among us for decades before we heard of the geneva convention bakin our greatest novelist 
has familiarized us with the medical treatment of a fallen foe in the principality of satsuma noted for its martial spirit and education the custom prevailed for young men to practice music not the blast of trumpets or the beat of drums those clamorous harbingers of blood and death stirring us to imitate the actions of a tiger but sad and tender melodies on the biva a musical instrument resembling the guitar soothing our fiery spirits drawing our thoughts away from scent of blood and scenes of carnage polybius tells us of the constitution of arcadia which required all youths under thirty to practice music in order that this gentle art might alleviate the rigors of that inclement region it is to its influence that he attributes the absence of cruelty in that part of the arcadian mountains nor was satsuma the only place in japan where gentleness was inculcated among the warrior class a prince of shirakawa jots down his random thoughts and among them is the following though they come stealing to your bedside in the silent watches of the night drive not away but rather cherish these the fragrance of flowers the sound of distant bells the insect humming of a frosty night and again though they may wound your feelings these three you have only to forgive the breeze that scatters your flowers the cloud that hides your moon and the man who tries to pick quarrels with you it was ostensibly to express but actually to cultivate these gentler emotions that the writing of verses was encouraged our poetry has therefore a strong undercurrent of pathos and tenderness a well-known anecdote of a rustic samurai illustrates a case in point when he was told to learn versification and the warbler's notes was given him for the subject of his first attempt his fiery spirit rebelled and he flung at the feet of his master this uncouth production which ran the brave warrior keeps apart the ear that might listen to the warbler's song his master undaunted by the crude sentiment continued to encourage the youth until one day the music of his soul was awakened to respond to the sweet notes of the uguizu and he wrote stands the warrior mailed and strong to hear the uguizu's song warbled sweet the trees among we admire and enjoy the heroic incident in kerner's short life when as he lay wounded on the battlefield he scribbled his famous farewell to life incidents of a similar kind were not at all unusual in our warfare our pithy epigrammatic poems were particularly well suited to the improvisation of a single sentiment everybody of any education was either a poet or a poetaster not infrequently a marching soldier might be seen to halt take his writing utensils from his belt and compose an ode and such papers were found afterward in the helmets or the breastplates when these were removed from their lifeless wearers. End of chapter 5「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 6 – Politeness what Christianity has done in Europe toward rousing compassion in the midst of belligerent horrors, love of music and letters has done in Japan. The cultivation of tender feelings breeds considerate regard for the sufferings of others. Modesty and complacence, actuated by respect for others' feelings, are at the root of politeness. That courtesy and urbanity of manners, which has been noticed by every foreign tourist as a marked Japanese trait. Politeness is a poor virtue if it is actuated only by a fear of offending good taste, whereas it should be the outward manifestation of a sympathetic regard for the feelings of others. It also implies a due regard for the fitness of things, therefore due respect to social positions, for these latter express no plutocratic distinctions, but were originally distinctions for actual merit. In its highest form, politeness almost approaches love. We may reverently say, Politeness suffereth long and is kind, envieth not, 
Wanteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, taketh not account of evil. Is it any wonder that Professor Dean, in speaking of the six elements of humanity, accords to politeness an exalted position, inasmuch as it is the ripest fruit of social intercourse? While thus extolling politeness, far be it from me to put it in the front rank of virtues. If we analyze it, we shall find it correlated with other virtues of a higher order, for what virtue stands alone? While, or rather because, it was exalted as peculiar to the profession of arms, and as such esteemed in a degree higher than its deserts, there came into existence its counterfeits. Confucius himself has repeatedly taught that external appurtenances are as little a part of propriety as sounds are of music. When propriety was elevated to the sine qua non of social intercourse, it was only to be expected that an elaborate system of etiquette should come into vogue to train youth in correct social behavior. How one must bow in accosting others, how we must walk and sit, were taught and learned with utmost care. Table manners grew to be a science. Tea serving and drinking were raised to a ceremony. A man of education is, of course, expected to be master of all these. Very fitly does Mr. Veblen, in his interesting book, Theory of the Leisure Class, call decorum a product and an exponent of the leisure class life. I have heard slighting remarks made by Europeans upon our elaborate discipline of politeness. It has been criticized as absorbing too much of our thought, and insofar a folly to observe strict obedience to it. I admit that there may be unnecessary niceties in ceremonious etiquette, but whether it partakes as much of folly as the adherence to ever-changing fashions of the West is a question not very clear to my mind. Even fashions I do not consider solely as freaks of vanity. On the contrary, I look upon these as a ceaseless search of the human mind for the beautiful. Much less do I consider elaborate ceremony as altogether trivial, for it denotes the result of long observation as to the most appropriate method of achieving a certain result. If there is anything to do, there is certainly a best way to do it, and the best way is both the most economical and the most graceful. Mr. Spencer defines grace as the most economical manner of motion. The tea ceremony presents certain definite ways of manipulating a bowl, a spoon, a napkin, etc., to a novice it looks tedious, but one soon discovers that the way prescribed is, after all, the most saving of time and labor, in other words, the most economical use of force, hence, according to Spencer's dictum, the most graceful. The spiritual significance of social decorum, or I might say, to borrow from the vocabulary of the philosophy of clothes, the spiritual discipline of which etiquette and ceremony are mere outward garments, is out of all proportion to what their appearance warrants us in believing. I might follow the example of Mr. Spencer and trace in our ceremonial institutions their origins and the moral motives that gave rise to them, but that is not what I shall endeavor to do in this book. It is the moral training involved in strict observance of propriety that I wish to emphasize. I have said that etiquette was elaborated into the finest niceties, so much so that different schools advocating different systems came into existence. But they all united in the ultimate essential, and this was put by a great exponent of the best-known school of etiquette, the Ogasawara, in the following terms. The end of all etiquette is to so cultivate your mind that even when you are quietly seated, not the roughest ruffian can dare make onset on your person. It means, in other words, that by constant exercise in correct manners, one brings all the parts and faculties of his body into perfect order and into such harmony with itself and its environment as to express the mastery of spirit over the flesh. 
what a new and deep significance the French word bienseance comes thus to contain. If the premise is true that gracefulness means economy of force, then it follows as a logical sequence that a constant practice of graceful deportment must bring with it a reserve and storage of force. Fine manners, therefore, mean power in repose. When the barbarian Gauls, during the sack of Rome, burst into the assembled senate and dared pull the beards of the venerable fathers, we think the old gentlemen were to blame, inasmuch as they lacked dignity and strength of manners. Is lofty spiritual attainment really possible through etiquette? Why not? All roads lead to Rome. As an example of how the simplest thing can be made into an art and then become spiritual culture, I may take Cha No Yu, the tea ceremony. Tea sipping is a fine art. Why should it not be? In the children drawing pictures on the sand, or in the savage carving on a rock, was the promise of a Raphael or a Michelangelo. How much more is the drinking of a beverage, which began with the transcendental contemplation of a Hindu anchorite, entitled to develop into a handmaid of religion and morality? That calmness of mind, that serenity of temper, that composure and quietness of demeanor, which are the first essentials of Cha No Yu, are without doubt the first conditions of right thinking and right feeling. The scrupulous cleanliness of the little room, shut off from sight and sound of the madding crowd, is in itself conductive to direct one's thoughts from the world. The bare interior does not engross one's attention like the innumerable pictures and bric-a-brac of a western parlour. The presence of kakemono, hanging scrolls which may be either paintings or ideograms used for decorative purposes, calls our attention more to grace of design than to beauty of color. The utmost refinement of taste is the object aimed at, whereas anything like display is banished with religious horror. The very fact that it was invented by a contemplative recluse in a time when wars and the rumors of wars were incessant is well calculated to show that this institution was more than a pastime. Before entering the quiet precincts of the tea-room, the company assembling to partake of the ceremony laid aside, together with their swords, the ferocity of the battlefield or the cares of government, there to find peace and friendship. Cha no Yu is more than a ceremony. It is a fine art. It is poetry, with articulate gestures for rhythm. It is a modus operandi of soul discipline. Its greatest value lies in this last phase. Not infrequently the other phases preponderated in the mind of its votaries, but that does not prove that its essence was not of a spiritual nature. Politeness will be a great acquisition if it does not more than impart grace to manners, but its function does not stop here. For propriety, springing as it does from motives of benevolence and modesty and actuated by tender feelings toward the sensibilities of others is ever a graceful expression of sympathy its requirement is that we should weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice such didactic requirement when reduced into small everyday details of life expresses itself in little acts scarcely noticeable or if noticed is as one missionary lady of twenty years residence once said to me awfully funny you are out in the hot glaring sun with no shade over you a japanese acquaintance passes by you accost him and instantly his hat is off while that is perfectly natural but the awfully funny performance is that all the while he talks with you his parasol is down and he stands in the glaring sun also how foolish yes exactly so provided the motive were less than this you are in the sun i sympathize with you i would willingly take you under my parasol if it were large enough or if we were familiarly acquainted as I cannot shade you, I will share your discomforts. Little acts of this kind, equally or more amusing, are not mere gestures or conventionalities. 
they are the bodying forth of thoughtful feelings for the comfort of others another awfully funny custom is dictated by our canons of politeness but many superficial writers on japan have dismissed it by simply attributing it to the general topsy-turviness of the nation every foreigner who has observed it will confess the awkwardness he felt in making proper reply upon the occasion in america when you make a gift you sing its praises to the recipient in japan we depreciate or slander it the underlying idea with you is this is a nice gift if it were not nice i would not dare give it to you for it will be an insult to give you anything but what is nice in contrast to this our logic runs you are a nice person and no gift is nice enough for you you will not accept anything i can lay at your feet except as a token of my good will so accept this not for its intrinsic value but as a token it will be an insult to your worth to call the best gift good enough for you place the two ideas side by side and we see that the ultimate idea is one and the same neither is awfully funny the american speaks of the material which makes the gift the japanese speaks of the spirit which prompts the gift it is perverse reasoning to conclude because our sense of propriety shows itself in all the smallest ramifications of our deportment to take the least important of them and uphold it as the type and pass judgment upon the principle itself which is more important to eat or to observe rules of propriety about eating a chinese sage answers if you take a case where the eating is all important and the observing the rules of propriety is of little importance and compare them together why merely say that the eating is of the more importance metal is heavier than feathers but does that saying have reference to a single clasp of metal and a wagon load of feathers take a piece of wood a foot thick and raise it above the pinnacle of a temple none would call it taller than the temple to the question which is the more important to tell the truth or to be polite the japanese are said to give an answer diametrically opposite to what the american will say but i forbear any comment until i come to speak of veracity or truthfulness without which politeness is a farce and a show End of chapter 6「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 7 – Veracity or Truthfulness Propriety carried beyond right bounds, says Masamune, becomes a lie. An ancient poet has outdone Polonius in the advice he gives. To thyself be faithful, if in thy heart thou strayest not from truth, without prayer of thine the gods will keep thee whole. The apotheosis of sincerity to which Tzu Tzu gives expression in the doctrine of the mean attributes to it transcendental powers, almost identifying them with the divine sincerity is the end and the beginning of all things without sincerity there would be nothing he then dwells with eloquence on its far-reaching and long-enduring nature its power to produce changes without movement and by its mere presence to accomplish its purpose without effort from the chinese ideogram for sincerity which is a combination of word and perfect one is tempted to draw a parallel between it and the neoplatonic doctrine of logos to such height does the sage soar in his unwanted mystic flight lying or equivocation were deemed equally cowardly the bushi held that his high social position demanded a loftier standard of veracity than that of the tradesman and peasant bushi no ichigon the word of a samurai or an exact german equivalent ein ritterwort was sufficient guarantee of the truthfulness of an assertion his word carried such weight with it that promises were generally made and fulfilled without a written pledge 
which would have been deemed quite beneath his dignity. Many thrilling anecdotes were told of those who atoned by death for Nigon, a double tongue. The regard for veracity was so high that, unlike the generality of Christians who persistently violate the plain commands of the teacher not to swear, the best of samurai looked upon an oath as derogatory to their honor. I am well aware that they did swear by different deities or upon their swords, but never has swearing degenerated into wanton form and irreverent interjection. To emphasize our words, a practice of literally sealing with blood was sometimes resorted to. For the explanation of such a practice, I need only refer my readers to Goethe's Faust. A recent American writer is responsible for this statement that if you ask an ordinary Japanese which is better to tell a falsehood or be impolite, he will not hesitate to answer, to tell a falsehood. Dr. Peary in The Gist of Japan is partly right and partly wrong. Right in that an ordinary Japanese, even a samurai, may answer in the way ascribed to him, but wrong in attributing too much weight to the term he translates falsehood. This word, in Japanese, uzo, is employed to denote anything which is not a truth, makoto, or fact, honto. Lowell tells us that Wordsworth could not distinguish between truth and fact, and an ordinary Japanese is in this respect as good as Wordsworth. Ask a Japanese, or even an American of any refinement, to tell you whether he dislikes you, or whether he is sick at his stomach, and he will not hesitate long to tell falsehoods and answer, I like you much, or I am quite well, thank you. To sacrifice truth merely for the sake of politeness was regarded as an empty form, kyore, and deception by sweet words, and was never justified. I own I am speaking now of the Bushido idea of veracity, but it may not be amiss to devote a few words to our commercial integrity, of which I have heard much complaint in foreign books and journals. A loose business morality has indeed been the worst blot on our national reputation, but before abusing it or hastily condemning the whole race for it, let us calmly study it, and we shall be rewarded with consolation for the future. Of all the great occupations of life, none was farther removed from the profession of arms than commerce. The merchant was placed lowest in the category of vocations, the knight, the tiller of the soil, the mechanic, the merchant. The samurai derived his income from land and could even indulge, if he had a mind to, in amateur farming, but the counter and abacus were abhorred. We knew the wisdom of this social arrangement. Montesquieu has made it clear that the debarring of the nobility from mercantile pursuits was an admirable social policy, in that it prevented wealth from accumulating in the hands of the powerful. The separation of power and riches kept the distribution of the latter more nearly equable. Professor Dill, the author of Roman Society in the Last Century of the Western Empire, has brought afresh to our mind that one cause of the decadence of the Roman Empire was the permission given to the nobility to engage in trade, and the consequent monopoly of wealth and power by a minority of the senatorial families. Commerce, therefore, in feudal Japan did not reach that degree of development which it would have attained under freer conditions. The obloquy attached to the calling naturally brought within its pale such as cared little for social repute. Call one a chief and he will steal. Put a stigma on a calling and its followers adjust their morals to it, for it is natural that the normal conscience as Hugh Black says, rises to the demands made on it, and easily falls to the limit of the standard expected from it. It is unnecessary to add that no business, commercial or otherwise, can be transacted without a code of morals. Our merchants of the feudal period had one among themselves, 
without which they could never have developed, as they did, such fundamental mercantile institution as the guild, the bank, the bourse, insurance, checks, bills of exchange, etc. But in their relations with people outside their vocation, the tradesmen lived too true to the reputation of their order. This being the case, when the country was open to foreign trade, only the most adventurous and unscrupulous rushed to the ports, while the respectable business houses declined for some time the repeated requests of the authorities to establish branch houses. Was Bushido powerless to stay the current of commercial dishonor? Let us see. Those who are well acquainted with our history will remember that only a few years after our treaty ports were opened to foreign trade, feudalism was abolished, and when with it the samurai's fiefs were taken and bonds issued to them in compensation, they were given liberty to invest them in mercantile transactions. Now you may ask, why could they not bring their much boasted veracity into their new business relations and so reform the old abuses? Those who had eyes to see could not weep enough. Those who had hearts to feel could not sympathize enough with the fate of many a noble and honest samurai who signally and irrevocably failed in his new and unfamiliar field of trade and industry through sheer lack of shrewdness in coping with his artful plebeian rival. When we know that 80% of the business houses fail in so industrial a country as America, is it any wonder that scarcely one among a hundred samurai who went into trade could succeed in his new vocation? It will be long before it will be recognized how many fortunes were wrecked in the attempt to apply Bushido ethics to business methods. But it was soon patent to every observing mind that the ways of wealth were not the ways of honor. In which respects, then, were they different? Of the three incentives to veracity that Lecky enumerates, that is, the industrial, the political, and the philosophical, the first was altogether lacking in Bushido. As to the second, it could develop little in a political community under a feudal system. It is in its philosophical, and as Lecky says, in its highest aspect, that honesty attained elevated rank in our catalogue of virtues. With all my sincere regard for the high commercial integrity of the Anglo-Saxon race, when I ask for the ultimate ground, I am told that honesty is the best policy, that it pays to be honest. Is not this virtue, then, its own reward? If it is followed because it brings in more cash than falsehood, I am afraid Bushido would rather indulge in lies. If Bushido rejects a doctrine of quid pro quo rewards, the shrewder tradesman will readily accept it. Lecky has very truly remarked that veracity owes its growth largely to commerce and manufacture. As Nietzsche puts it, honesty is the youngest of virtues. In other words, it is the foster child of industry, of modern industry. Without this mother, veracity was like a blue-blood orphan whom only the most cultivated mind could adopt and nourish. Such minds were general among the samurai, but, for want of a more democratic and utilitarian foster-mother, the tender child failed to thrive. Industries advancing, veracity will prove an easy, nay, a profitable virtue to practice. Just think, as late as November 1880, Bismarck sent a circular to the professional consuls of the German Empire, warning them of a lamentable lack of reliability with regard to German shipments inter alia, apparent both as to quality and quantity. Nowadays we hear comparatively little of German carelessness and dishonesty in trade. In twenty years her merchants learned that in the end honesty pays. Already our merchants are finding that out. For the rest, I recommend the reader to two recent writers for well-weighed judgment on this point. Begin footnote. Knapp, Feudal and Modern Japan, and Ransom, Japan in Transition.
End footnote. It is interesting to remark in this connection that integrity and honor were the surest guarantees which even a merchant debtor could present in the form of promissory notes. It was quite a usual thing to insert such clauses as these. In default of the repayment of the sum lent to me, I shall say nothing against being ridiculed in public, or, in case I fail to pay you back, you may call me a fool, and the like. Often have I wondered whether the veracity of Bushido had any motive higher than courage. In the absence of any positive commandment against bearing false witness, lying was not condemned as sin, but simply denounced as weakness, and, as such, highly dishonorable. As a matter of fact, the idea of honesty is so intimately blended, and its Latin and its German etymology so identified with honor, that it is high time I should pause a few moments for the consideration of this feature of the precepts of knighthood. End of chapter 7「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 8 Honor The sense of honor, implying a vivid consciousness of personal dignity and worth, could not fail to characterize the samurai, born and bred to value the duties and privileges of their profession. Though the word ordinarily given nowadays as the translation of honor was not used freely, Yet the idea was conveyed by such terms as na, name, menmoku, countenance, guaibun, outside hearing, reminding us respectively of the biblical use of name, of the evolution of the term personality from the Greek mask, and of fame. A good name, one's reputation, the immortal part of one's self, what remains being bestial, assumed as a matter of course. Any infringement upon its integrity was felt as shame, and the sense of shame, ren chi shin, was one of the earliest to be cherished in juvenile education. You will be laughed at. It will disgrace you. Are you not ashamed? Were the last appeal to correct behavior on the part of a youthful delinquent. Such a recourse to his honor touched the most sensitive spot in the child's heart, as though it had been nursed on honor while it was in its mother's womb, for most truly is honor a prenatal influence, being closely bound up with strong family consciousness. In losing the solidarity of families, says Balzac, society has lost the fundamental force which Montesquieu named honor. Indeed, the sense of shame seems to me to be the earliest indication of the moral consciousness of our race. The first and worst punishment which befell humanity in consequence of tasting the fruit of that forbidden tree was, to my mind, not the sorrow of childbirth, nor the thorns and thistles, but the awakening of the sense of shame. Few incidents in history excel in pathos the scene of the first mother plying with heaving breast and tremulous fingers, her crude needle on the few fig leaves which her dejected husband plucked for her. This first fruit of disobedience clings to us with a tenacity that nothing else does. All the sartorial ingenuity of mankind has not yet succeeded in sewing an apron that will efficaciously hide our sense of shame. That samurai was right who refused to compromise his character by a slight humiliation in his youth, because, he said, this honor is like a scar on a tree, which time, instead of effacing, only helps to enlarge. Mencius had taught, centuries before, in almost the identical phrase, what Carlyle has latterly expressed, namely, that shame is the soil of all virtue, of good manners and good morals. The fear of disgrace was so great that if our literature lacks such eloquence as Shakespeare puts into the mouth of Norfolk, 
it nevertheless hung like Damocles' sword over the head of every samurai and often assumed a morbid character. In the name of honor, deeds were perpetrated which can find no justification in the code of Bushido. At the slightest, nay, imaginary insult, the quick-tempered braggart took offense, resorted to the use of the sword, and many an unnecessary strife was raised, and many an innocent life lost. The story of a well-meaning citizen, who called the attention of a bushi to a flea jumping on his back, and who was forthwith cut in two, for the simple and questionable reason that inasmuch as fleas are parasites which feed on animals, it was an unpardonable insult to identify a noble warrior with a beast, I say, stories like these are too frivolous to believe. Yet, the circulation of such stories implies three things. One, that they were invented to overawe common people, two, that abuses were really made of the samurai's profession of honor, and three, that a very strong sense of shame was developed among them. It is plainly unfair to take an abnormal case to cast blame upon the precepts, any more than to judge of the true teaching of Christ from the fruits of religious fanaticism and extravagance, inquisitions and hypocrisy. But, as in religious monomania there is something touchingly noble, as compared with the delirium tremens of a drunkard, so in that extreme sensitiveness of the samurai about their honor, do we not recognize the substratum of a genuine virtue? The morbid excess into which the delicate code of honor was inclined to run was strongly counterbalanced by preaching magnanimity and patience. To take offense at slight provocation was ridiculed as short-tempered. The popular adage said, To bear what you think you cannot bear is really to bear. The great Ieyasu left to posterity a few maxims, among which are the following. The life of man is like going a long distance with a heavy load upon the shoulders. Haste not. Reproach none, but be forever watchful of thine own shortcomings. Forbearance is the basis of length of days. He proved in his life what he preached. A literary wit put a characteristic epigram into the mouths of three well-known personages in our history. To Nobunaga he attributed, I will kill her if the nightingale sings not in time. To Hideyoshi, I will force her to sing for me. And to Ieyasu, I will wait till she opens her lips. Patience and long-suffering were also highly commended by Mencius. In one place he writes to this effect, Though you denude yourself and insult me, what is that to me? You cannot defile my soul by your outrage. Elsewhere he teaches that anger at a petty offense is unworthy a superior man, but indignation for a great cause is righteous wrath. To what height of unmartial and unresisting meekness Bushido could reach in some of its votaries may be seen in their utterances. Take, for instance, this saying of Ogawa, When others speak all manner of evil things against thee, return not evil for evil, but rather reflect that thou wast not more faithful in the discharge of thy duties. Take another of Kumazawa. When others blame thee, blame them not. When others are angry at thee, return not anger. Joy cometh only as passion and desire part. Still another instance I may cite from Saigo, upon whose overhanging brows shame is ashamed to sit. The way is the way of heaven and earth. Man's place is to follow it. Therefore, make it the object of thy life to reverence heaven. Heaven loves me and others with equal love. Therefore, with the love wherewith thou lovest thyself, love others. Make not men thy partner, but heaven. And making heaven thy partner, 
do thy best never condemn others but see to it that thou comest not short of thine own mark some of those sayings remind us of christian expostulations and show us how far in practical morality natural religion can approach the revealed not only did these sayings remain as utterances but they were really embodied in acts it must be admitted that very few attained this sublime height of magnanimity patience and forgiveness it was a great pity that nothing clear and general was expressed as to what constitutes honour only a few enlightened minds being aware that it from no condition rises but that it lies in each acting well his part for nothing was easier than for youths to forget in the heat of action what they had learned in mentions in their calmer moments said this sage tis in every man's mind to love honour but little doth he dream that what is truly honourable lies within himself and not anywhere else the honour which men confer is not good honour those whom chow the great in nobles he can make mean again for the most part an insult was quickly resented and repaid by death as we shall see later while honour too often nothing higher than vainglory or worldly approbation was prized as the summum bonum of earthly existence fame and not wealth or knowledge was the goal toward which youth set to strive many a lad swore within himself as he crossed the threshold of his paternal home that he would not recross it until he had made a name in the world and many an ambitious mother refused to see her sons again unless they could return home as the expression is caparisoned in brocade to shun shame or win a name samurai boys would submit to any privations and undergo severest ordeals of bodily or mental suffering they knew that honour won in youth grows with age in the memorable siege of osaka a young son of iyeyasu in spite of his earnest entreaties to be put in the vanguard was placed at the rear of the army when the castle fell he was so chagrined and wept so bitterly that an old councillor tried to console him with all the resources at his command take comfort sire said he at thought of the long future before you in the many years that you may live there will come diverse occasions to distinguish yourself the boy fixed his indignant gaze upon the man and said how foolishly you talk can ever my fourteenth year come round again life itself was thought cheap if honour and fame could be attained therewith hence whenever a cause presented itself which was considered dearer than life with utmost serenity and celerity was life laid down end of chapter eight bushido the soul of japan by inazo nitobe chapter nine the duty of loyalty of the causes in comparison with which no life was too dear to sacrifice was the duty of loyalty which was the keystone making feudal virtues a symmetrical arch other virtues feudal morality shares in common with other systems of ethics with other classes of people but this virtue homage and fealty to a superior is its distinctive feature i am aware that personal fidelity is a moral adhesion existing among all sorts and conditions of men a gang of pickpockets or allegiance to a fagin but it is only in the code of chivalrous honour that loyalty assumes paramount importance in spite of hegel's criticism that the fidelity of feudal vassals being an obligation to an individual and not to a commonwealth is a bond established on totally unjust principles a great compatriot of his made it his boast that personal loyalty was a german virtue 
Bismarck had good reason to do so, not because the Treue he boasts of was the monopoly of his fatherland or of any single nation or race, but because this favored fruit of chivalry lingers latest among the people where feudalism has lasted longest. In America, where everybody is as good as anybody else, and, as the Irishman added, better too, such exalted ideas of loyalty as we feel for our sovereign may be deemed excellent within certain bounds, but preposterous as encouraged among us. Montesquieu complained long ago that right on one side of the Pyrenees was wrong on the other, and the recent Dreyfus trial proved the truth of his remark, save that the Pyrenees were not the sole boundary beyond which French justice finds no accord. Similarly, loyalty as we conceive it may find few admirers elsewhere, not because our conception is wrong, but because it is, I am afraid, forgotten, and also because we carry it to a degree not reached in any other country. Griffiths was quite right in stating in Religions of Japan that whereas in China Confucian ethics made obedience to parents the primary human duty, in Japan precedence was given to loyalty. At the risk of shocking some of my good readers, I will relate of one who could endure to follow a fallen lord, and who thus, as Shakespeare assures, earned a place see the story. The story is of one of the purest characters in our history, Michizane, who, falling a victim to jealousy and calumny, is exiled from the capital. Not content with this, his unrelenting enemies are now bent upon the extinction of his family. Strict search for his son, not yet grown, reveals the fact of his being secreted in a village school kept by one Genzo, a former vassal of Michizane. When orders are dispatched to the schoolmaster to deliver the head of the juvenile offender on a certain day, his first idea is to find a suitable substitute for it. He ponders over his school list, scrutinizes with careful eyes all the boys as they stroll into the classroom, but none among the children born of the soil bears the least resemblance to his protégé. His despair, however, is but for a moment, for, behold, a new scholar is announced, a comely boy of the same age as his master's son, escorted by a mother of noble mien. No less conscious of the resemblance between infant lord and infant retainer were the mother and the boy himself. In the privacy of home both had laid themselves upon the altar, the one his life, the other her heart, yet without sign to the outer world. Unwitting of what had passed between them, it is the teacher from whom comes the suggestion. Here, then, is the scapegoat. The rest of the narrative may be briefly told. On the day appointed arrives the officer commissioned to identify and receive the head of the youth. Will he be deceived by the false head? The poor Genzo's hand is on the hilt of the sword, ready to strike a blow either at the man or at himself, should the examination defeat his scheme. The officer takes up the gruesome object before him, goes calmly over each feature, and in a deliberate, business-like tone, pronounces it genuine. That evening in a lonely home awaits the mother we saw in the school. Does she know the fate of her child? It is not for his return that she watches with eagerness for the opening of the wicket. Her father-in-law has been for a long time a recipient of Michizane's bounties, but since his banishment, circumstances have forced her husband to follow the service of the enemy of his family's benefactor. He himself could not be untrue to his own cruel master, but his son could serve the cause of the grandsire's lord. As one acquainted with the exile's family, it was he who had been entrusted with the task of identifying the boy's head. Now the days... Yeah, the life's hard work is done. He returns home, and as he crosses its threshold, he accosts his wife, saying, Rejoice, my wife! Our darling son has proved of service to his lord. What an atrocious story! I hear my readers exclaim. 
parents deliberately sacrificing their own innocent child to save the life of another man's. But this child was a conscious and willing victim. It is a story of vicarious death, as significant as, and not more revolting than, the story of Abraham's intended sacrifice of Isaac. In both cases, it was obedience to the call of duty, utter submission to the command of a higher voice, whether given by a visible or an invisible angel, or heard by an outward or an inward ear. But I abstain from preaching. The individualism of the West, which recognizes separate interests for father and son, husband and wife, necessarily brings into strong relief the duties owed by one to the other, but Bushido held that the interest of the family and of the members thereof is intact, one and inseparable. This interest it bound up with affection, natural, instinctive, irresistible. Hence, if we die for one we love with natural love, which animals themselves possess, what is that? For if ye love them that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? In his great history, Sanyo relates in touching language the hard struggle of Shigemori concerning his father's rebellious conduct. If I be loyal, my father must be undone. If I obey my father, my duty to my sovereign must go amiss. Poor Shigemori! We see him afterward praying with all his soul that kind heaven may visit him with death that he may be released from this world where it is hard for purity and righteousness to dwell. Many a Shigemori has his heart torn by the conflict between duty and affection. Indeed, neither Shakespeare nor the Old Testament itself contains an adequate rendering of Ko, our conception of filial piety. And yet, in such conflicts Bushido never wavered in its choice of loyalty. Women, too, encourage their offspring to sacrifice all for the king. Ever as resolute as widow Wyntam and her illustrious consort, the samurai matron stood ready to give up her boys for the cause of loyalty. Since Bushido, like Aristotle and some modern sociologists, conceived the state as antedating the individual, the latter being born into the former as part and parcel thereof, he must live and die for it, or for the incumbent of its legitimate authority. Readers of Crito will remember the argument with which Socrates represents the laws of the city as pleading with him on the subject of his escape. Among others, he makes them, the laws, or the state, say, Since you were begotten and nurtured and educated under us, dare you once to say you are not our offspring and servant, you and your fathers before you. These are words which do not impress us as anything extraordinary, for the same thing has long been on the lips of Bushido, with this modification that the laws and the state were represented with us by a personal being. Loyalty is an ethical outcome of this political theory. I am not entirely ignorant of Mr. Spencer's view according to which political obedience, loyalty, is accredited with only a transitional function. It may be so. Sufficient unto the day is the virtue thereof. We may complacently repeat it, especially as we believe that day to be a long space of time, during which, so our national anthem says, tiny pebbles grow into mighty rocks scraped with moss. We may remember at this juncture that even among so democratic a people as the English, the sentiment of personal fidelity to a man and his posterity which their Germanic ancestors felt for their chiefs has, as M. Boutmy recently said, only passed more or less into their profound loyalty to the race and blood of their princes, as evidenced in their extraordinary attachment to the dynasty. Political subordination, Mr. Spencer predicts, will give place to loyalty to the dictates of conscience. Suppose his induction is realized. Will loyalty and its concomitant instinct of reverence disappear forever? 
we transfer our allegiance from one master to another without being unfaithful to either from being subjects of a ruler that wields the temporal sceptre we become servants of the monarch who sits enthroned in the penetralia of our heart a few years ago a very stupid controversy started by the misguided disciples of spencer made havoc among the reading class of japan in their zeal to uphold the claim of the throne to undivided loyalty they charged christians with treasonable propensities in that they avow fidelity to their lord and master they arrayed forth sophistical arguments without the wit of sophists and scholastic tortuosities minus the niceties of the schoolmen little did they know that we can in a sense serve two masters without holding to the one or despising the other rendering unto caesar the things that are caesar's and unto god the things that are god's did not socrates all the while he unflinchingly refused to concede one iota of loyalty to his demon obey with equal fidelity and equanimity the command of his earthly master the state his conscience he followed alive his country he served dying alack the day when a state grows so powerful as to demand of its citizens the dictates of their conscience bushido did not require us to make our conscience the slave of any lord or king thomas mowbray was a veritable spokesman for us when he said myself i throw dread sovereign at thy foot my life thou shalt command but not my shame the one my duty owes but my fair name despite of death that lives upon my grave to dark dishonour's use thou shalt not have a man who sacrificed his own conscience to the capricious will or freak or fancy of a sovereign was accorded a low place in the estimate of the precepts such an one was despised as nei shin a cringeling who makes court by unscrupulous fawning or as cho shin a favorite who steals his master's affections by means of servile compliance these two species of subjects corresponding exactly to those which iago describes the one a duteous and knee-crooking knave doting on his own obsequious bondage wearing out his time much like his master's ass the other trimmed in forms and visages of duty keeping yet his heart attending on himself when a subject differed from his master the loyal path for him to pursue was to use every available means to persuade him of his error as kent did to king lear failing in this let the master deal with him as he wills in cases of this kind it was quite the usual course for the samurai to make the last appeal to the intelligence and conscience of his lord by demonstrating the sincerity of his words with the shedding of his own blood End of chapter nine Bushido the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe Chapter ten Education and Training of a Samurai Life being regarded as the means whereby to serve his master, and its ideal being set upon honor, the whole education and training of a samurai were conducted accordingly. The first point to observe in knightly pedagogics was to build up character, leaving in the shade the subtler faculties of prudence, intelligence, and dialectics. We have seen the important part aesthetic accomplishments played in his education indispensable as they were to a man of culture they were accessories rather than essentials of samurai training intellectual superiority was of course esteemed but the word chi which was employed to denote intellectuality meant wisdom in the first instance and placed knowledge only in a very subordinate place the tripod that supported the framework of Bushido was said to be Chi, Jin, Yu, respectively wisdom, benevolence, and courage. A samurai was essentially a man of action. 
science was without the pale of his activity. He took advantage of it in so far as it concerned his profession of arms. Religion and theology were relegated to the priests. He concerned himself with them in so far as they helped to nourish courage. Like an English poet, the samurai believed, "'Tis not the creed that saves the man, but it is the man that justifies the creed." Philosophy and literature formed the chief part of his intellectual training, but even in the pursuit of these it was not objective truth that he strove after. Literature was pursued mainly as a pastime, and philosophy as a practical aid in the formation of character, if not for the exposition of some military or political problem. From what has been said, it will not be surprising to note that the curriculum of studies, according to the pedagogics of Bushido, consisted mainly of the following. Fencing, archery, jiu-jitsu or yavara, horsemanship, the use of the spear, tactics, calligraphy, ethics, literature and history. Of these, jiu-jitsu and calligraphy may require a few words of explanation. Great stress was laid on good writing, probably because our logograms, partaking as they do of the nature of pictures, possess artistic value, and also because chirography was accepted as indicative of one's personal character. Jiu-jitsu may be briefly defined as an application of anatomical knowledge to the purpose of offense or defense. It differs from wrestling in that it does not depend upon muscular strength. It differs from other forms of attack in that it uses no weapon. Its feet consist in clutching or striking such part of the enemy's body as will make him numb and incapable of resistance. Its object is not to kill, but to incapacitate one for action for the time being. A subject of study which one would expect to find in military education, and which is rather conspicuous by its absence in the Bushido course of instruction, is mathematics. This, however, can be readily explained in part by the fact that feudal warfare was not carried on with scientific precision. Not only that, but the whole training of the samurai was unfavorable to fostering numerical notions. Chivalry is uneconomical. It boasts of penury. It says with Venditius that ambition, the soldier's virtue, rather makes choice of loss than gain which darkens him. Don Quixote takes more pride in his rusty spear and skin and bone horse than in gold and lands, and the samurai is in hearty sympathy with his exaggerated confrere of La Mancha. He disdains money itself the art of making or hoarding it. It is to him veritably filthy lucre. The hackneyed expression to describe the decadence of an age is that the civilians loved money and the soldiers feared death. Niggardliness of gold and of life excites as much disapprobation as their lavish use is panegorized. Less than all things, says a current precept, men must grudge money. It is by riches that wisdom is hindered. Hence, children were brought up with utter disregard of economy. It was considered bad taste to speak of it, and ignorance of the value of different coins was a token of good breeding. Knowledge of numbers was indispensable in the mustering of forces as well, as in the distribution of benefices and fiefs, but the counting of money was left to meaner hands. In many feudatories, public finance was administered by a lower kind of samurai or by priests. Every thinking bushi knew well enough that money formed the sinews of war, but he did not think of raising the appreciation of money to a virtue. It is true that thrift was enjoined by Bushido, but not for economical reasons, so much as for the exercise of abstinence. Luxury was thought the greatest menace to manhood, and severest simplicity was required of the warrior class, sumptuary laws being enforced in many of the clans. We read that in ancient Rome the farmers of revenue and other financial agents were gradually raised to the rank of knights, 
the state thereby showing its appreciation of their service and of the importance of money itself how closely this was connected with the luxury and avarice of the romans may be imagined not so with the precepts of knighthood these persisted in systematically regarding finance as something low low as compared with moral and intellectual vocations money and the love of it being thus diligently ignored bushido itself could long remain free from a thousand and one evils of which money is the root this is sufficient reason for the fact that our public men have long been free from corruption but alas how fast plutocracy is making its way in our time and generation the mental discipline which would nowadays be chiefly aided by the study of mathematics was supplied by literary exegesis and deontological discussions very few abstract subjects troubled the mind of the young the chief aim of their education being as i have said decision of character people whose minds were simply stored with information found no great admirers of the three services of studies that bacon gives for delight ornament and ability bushido had decided preference for the last where their use was in judgment and the disposition of business whether it was for the disposition of public business or for the exercise of self-control it was with a practical end in view that education was conducted learning without thought said confucius is labor lost thought without learning is perilous when character and not intelligence when the soul and not the head is chosen by a teacher for the material to work upon and to develop his vocation partakes of a sacred character it is the parent who has borne me it is the teacher who makes me man with this idea therefore the esteem in which one's preceptor was held was very high a man to evoke such confidence and respect from the young must necessarily be endowed with superior personality without lacking erudition he was a father to the fatherless and an adviser to the erring thy father and thy mother so runs our maxim are like heaven and earth thy teacher and thy lord are like the sun and moon the present system of paying for every sort of service was not in vogue among the adherents of bushido it believed in a service which can be rendered only without money and without price spiritual service be it of priest or teacher was not to be repaid in gold or silver not because it was valueless but because it was invaluable here the non-arithmetical honored instinct of bushido taught a truer lesson than modern political economy for wages and salaries can be paid only for services whose results are definite tangible and measurable whereas the best service done in education namely in soul development and this includes the services of a pastor is not definite tangible or measurable being immeasurable money the ostensible measure of value is of inadequate use usage sanctioned that pupils brought to their teachers money or goods at different seasons of the year but these were not payments but offerings which indeed were welcome to the recipients as they were usually men of stern caliber boasting of honorable penury too dignified to work with their hands and too proud to beg they were grave personifications of high spirits undaunted by adversity they were an embodiment of what was considered as an end of all learning and were thus a living example of that discipline of disciplines self-control which was universally required of samurai end of chapter ten Bushido, the Soul of Japan, by Inazo Nitobe, Chapter Eleven, Self-Control. The discipline of fortitude, on the one hand, inculcating endurance without a groan, and the teaching of politeness, on the other, requiring us not to mar the pleasure or serenity of another by manifestations of our own sorrow or pain 
combined to engender a stoical turn of mind and eventually to confirm it into a national trait of apparent stoicism i say apparent stoicism because i do not believe that true stoicism can ever become the characteristic of a whole nation and also because some of our national manners and customs may seem to a foreign observer hard-hearted yet we are really as susceptible to tender emotion as any race under the sky i am inclined to think that in one sense we have to feel more than others yes doubly more since the very attempt to restrain natural promptings entails suffering imagine boys and girls too brought up not to resort to the shedding of a tear or the uttering of a groan for the relief of their feelings and there is a physiological problem whether such effort steals their nerves or makes them more sensitive it was considered unmanly for a samurai to betray his emotions on his face he shows no sign of joy or anger was a phrase used in describing a strong character the most natural affections were kept under control a father could embrace his son only at the expense of his dignity a husband would not kiss his wife no not in the presence of other people whatever he might do in private there may be some truth in the remark of a witty youth when he said american husbands kiss their wives in public and beat them in private japanese husbands beat theirs in public and kiss them in private calmness of behavior composure of mind should not be disturbed by passion of any kind i remember when during the late war with china a regiment left a certain town a large concourse of people flocked to the station to bid farewell to the general and his army on this occasion an american resident resorted to the place expecting to witness loud demonstrations as the nation itself was highly excited and there were fathers mothers and sweethearts of the soldiers in the crowd the american was strangely disappointed for as the whistle blew and the train began to move the hats of thousands of people were silently taken off and their heads bowed in reverential farewell no waving of handkerchiefs no word uttered but deep silence in which only an attentive ear could catch a few broken sobs in domestic life too i know of a father who spent whole nights listening to the breathing of a sick child standing behind the door that he might not be caught in such an act of parental weakness i know of a mother who in her last moments refrained from sending for her son that he might not be disturbed in his studies our history and everyday life are replete with examples of heroic matrons who can well bear comparison with some of the most touching pages of plutarch among our peasantry an ian mclaren would be sure to find many a margaret hoe it is the same discipline of self-restraint which is accountable for the absence of more frequent revivals in the christian churches of japan when a man or woman feels his or her soul stirred the first instinct is to quietly suppress any indication of it in rare instances is the tongue set free by an irresistible spirit when we have eloquence of sincerity and fervor it is putting a premium upon a breach of the third commandment to encourage speaking lightly of spiritual experience it is truly jarring to japanese ears to hear the most sacred words the most secret hard experiences thrown out in promiscuous audiences dost thou feel the soil of thy soul stirred with tender thoughts it is time for seeds to sprout disturb it not with speech but let it work alone in quietness and secrecy writes a young samurai in his diary to give in so many articulate words one's inmost thoughts and feelings notably the religious is taken among us as an unmistakable sign that they are neither very profound nor very sincere only a pomegranate is he so runs a popular saying who when he gapes his mouth displays the contents of his heart 
it is not altogether perverseness of oriental minds that the instant our emotions are moved we try to guard our lips in order to hide them speech is very often with us as the frenchman defined it the art of concealing thought call upon a japanese friend in time of deepest affliction and he will invariably receive you laughing with red eyes or moist cheeks at first you may think him hysterical press him for an explanation and you will get a few broken commonplaces human life has sorrow they who meet must part he that is born must die it is foolish to count the years of a child that is gone but a woman's heart will indulge in follies and the like so the noble words of a noble hohenzollern lerne zu leiden ohne klagen had found many responsive minds among us long before they were uttered indeed the japanese have recourse to risibility whenever the frailties of human nature are put to severest test i think we possess a better reason than democritus himself for our abderian tendency for laughter with us oftenest veils an effort to regain balance of temper when disturbed by any untoward circumstance it is a counterpoise of sorrow or rage the suppression of feelings being thus steadily insisted upon they find their safety valve in poetical aphorism a poet of the tenth century writes in japan and china as well humanity when moved by sorrow tells its bitter grief in verse a mother who tries to console her broken heart by fancying her departed child absent on his wonted chase after the dragonfly hums how far today in chase i wonder has gone my hunter of the dragonfly i refrain from quoting other examples for i know i could do only scant justice to the pearly gems of our literature were i to render into a foreign tongue the thoughts which were wrung drop by drop from bleeding hearts and threaded into beads of rarest value i hope i have in a measure shown that inner working of our minds which often presents an appearance of callousness or of a hysterical mixture of laughter and dejection and whose sanity is sometimes called in question it has also been suggested that our endurance of pain and indifference to death are due to less sensitive nerves this is plausible as far as it goes the next question is why are our nerves less tightly strung it may be our climate is not so stimulating as the american it may be our monarchical form of government does not excite us as much as the republic does the frenchman it may be that we do not read sartor resartus as zealously as the englishman personally i believe it was our very excitability and sensitiveness which made it a necessity to recognize and enforce constant self-repression but whatever may be the explanation without taking into account long years of discipline and self-control none can be correct discipline and self-control can easily go too far it can well repress the genial current of the soul it can force pliant natures into distortions and monstrosities it can beget bigotry breed hypocrisy or habitate affections be a virtue never so noble it has its counterpart and counterfeit we must recognize in each virtue its own positive excellence and follow its positive ideal and the ideal of self-restraint is to keep our mind level as our expression is or to borrow a greek term attain the state of euthymia which democritus called the highest good end of chapter 11「Bushido, the soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 12 The Institutions of Suicide and Redress The acme of self-control is reached and best illustrated in the first of the two institutions which we shall now bring to view, namely, the institutions of suicide and redress, of which 
the former known as harakiri and the latter as kataki uchi many foreign writers have treated more or less fully to begin with suicide let me state that i confine my observations only to seppuku or kapuku popularly known as harakiri which means self-immolation by disembowelment ripping the abdomen how absurd so cry those to whom the name is new absurdly odd as it may sound at first to foreign ears it cannot be so very foreign to students of shakespeare who puts these words in brutus mouth thy caesar's spirit walks abroad and turns our swords into our proper entrails listen to a modern english poet who in his light of asia speaks of a sword piercing the bowels of a queen none blames him for bad english or breach of modesty or to take still another example look at guercino's painting of cato's death in the palazzo rossa in genoa whoever has read the swan song which edison makes cato sing will not jeer at the sword half buried in his abdomen in our minds this mode of death is associated with instances of noblest deeds and of most touching pathos so that nothing repugnant much less ludicrous mars our conception of it so wonderful is the transforming power of virtue of greatness of tenderness that the vilest form of death assumes a sublimity and becomes a symbol of new life or else the sign which constantine beheld would not conquer the world not for extraneous associations only does seppuku lose in our mind any taint of absurdity for the choice of this particular part of the body to operate upon was based on an old anatomical belief as to the seat of the soul and of the affections when moses wrote of joseph's bowels yearning upon his brother or David prayed the Lord not to forget his bowels, or when Isaiah, Jeremiah, and other inspired men of old spoke of the sounding or the troubling of bowels, they all and each endorsed the belief prevalent among the Japanese that in the abdomen was enshrined the soul. The Semites habitually spoke of the liver and kidneys and surrounding fat as the seat of emotion and of life. The term hara was more comprehensive than the Greek phren or thumos, and the Japanese and Hellenes alike thought the spirit of man to dwell somewhere in that region. Such a notion is by no means confined to the peoples of antiquity. The French, in spite of the theory propounded by one of their most distinguished philosophers, Descartes, that the soul is located in the pineal gland, still insist in using the term ventre in a sense which, if anatomically too vague, is nevertheless physiologically significant. Similarly, entraille stands in their language for affection and compassion nor is such belief mere superstition being more scientific than the general idea of making the heart the centre of the feelings without asking a friar the japanese knew better than romeo in what vile part of this anatomy one's name did lodge modern neurologists speak of the abdominal and pelvic brains denoting thereby sympathetic nerve centers in those parts which are strongly affected by any psychical action this view of mental physiology once admitted the syllogism of seppuku is easy to construct i will open the seat of my soul and show you how it fares with it see for yourself whether it is polluted or clean I do not wish to be understood as asserting religious or even moral justification of suicide, but the high estimate placed upon honor was ample excuse with many for taking one's own life. How many acquiesced in the sentiment expressed by Garth, when honor's lost, tis a relief to die, death's but a sure retreat from infamy, and have smilingly surrendered their souls to oblivion death when honor was involved was accepted in bushido as a key to the solution of many complex problems so that to an ambitious samurai a natural departure from life seemed a rather tame affair and a consummation not devoutly to be wished for i dare say that many good christians if only they are honest enough 
will confess the fascination of, if not positive admiration for, the sublime composure with which Cato, Brutus, Petronius, and a host of other ancient worthies terminated their own earthly existence. Is it too bold to hint that the death of the first of the philosophers was partly suicidal? When we are told so minutely by his pupils how their master willingly submitted to the mandate of the state, which he knew was morally mistaken, in spite of the possibilities of escape, and how he took up the cup of hemlock in his own hand, even offering libation from its deadly contents, do we not discern in his whole proceeding and demeanor an act of self-immolation? No physical compulsion here, as in ordinary cases of execution. True, the verdict of the judges was compulsory. It said, Thou shalt die, and that by thy own hand. If suicide meant no more than dying by one's own hand, Socrates was a clear case of suicide. But nobody would charge him with the crime. Plato, who was averse to it, would not call his master a suicide. Now my readers will understand that seppuku was not a mere suicidal process. It was an institution, legal and ceremonial. An invention of the Middle Ages, it was a process by which warriors could expiate their crimes, apologize for errors, escape from disgrace, redeem their friends, or prove their sincerity. When enforced as a legal punishment, it was practiced with due ceremony. It was a refinement of self-destruction, and none could perform it without the utmost coolness of temper and composure of demeanor, and for these reasons it was particularly befitting the profession of Bushi. Antiquarian curiosity, if nothing else, would tempt me to give here a description of these obsolete ceremonial, but seeing that such a description was made by a far abler writer, whose book is not much read nowadays, I am tempted to make a somewhat lengthy quotation. Mitford, in his Tales of Old Japan, after giving a translation of a treatise on seppuku from a rare Japanese manuscript, goes on to describe an instance of such an execution of which he was an eyewitness. We, seven foreign representatives, were invited to follow the Japanese witness into the hondo, or main hall of the temple, where the ceremony was to be performed. It was an imposing scene, a large hall with a high roof supported by dark pillars of wood. From the ceiling hung a profusion of those huge gilt lamps and ornaments peculiar to Buddhist temples. In front of the high altar, where the floor, covered with beautiful white mats, is raised some three or four inches from the ground, was laid a rug of scarlet felt. Tall candles placed at regular intervals gave out a dim mysterious light, just sufficient to let all the proceedings be seen. The seven Japanese took their places on the left of the raised floor, the seven foreigners on the right. No other person was present. After the interval of a few minutes of anxious suspense, Taki Zenzaburo, a stalwart man thirty-two years of age, with a noble air, walked into the hall attired in his dress of ceremony, with the peculiar hempen cloth wings which are worn on great occasions. He was accompanied by a kaishaku and three officers, who wore the jimbaori, or war surcoat, with gold tissue facings. The word kaishaku, it should be observed, is one to which our word executioner is no equivalent term. The office is that of a gentleman. In many cases it is performed by a kinsman or friend of the condemned, and the relation between them is rather that of principal and second than that of victim and executioner. In this instance the kaishaku was a pupil of Taki Senzaburo, and was selected by friends of the latter from among their own number for his skill in swordsmanship. With the kaishaku on his left hand, Taki Senzaburo advanced slowly towards the Japanese witnesses, and the two bowed before them. Then, drawing near to the foreigners, they saluted us in the same way, perhaps even with more deference. In each case the salutation was ceremoniously returned. Slowly and with great dignity, the condemned man mounted on to the raised floor, 
prostrated himself before the high altar twice, and seated himself on the felt carpet with his back to the high altar, the kaishaku crouching on his left-hand side. One of the three attendant officers then came forward, bearing a stand of the kind used in the temple for offerings, on which, wrapped in paper, lay the wakitsashi, the short sword or dirk of the Japanese, nine inches and a half in length, with a point and an edge as sharp as a razor's. This he handed, prostrating himself, to the condemned man, who received it reverently, raising it to his head with both hands, and placed it in front of himself. After another profound obeisance, Taki Saburo, in a voice which betrayed just so much emotion and hesitation as might be expected from a man who is making a painful confession, but with no sign of either in his face or manner, spoke as follows. I, and I alone, unwarrantably gave the order to fire on the foreigners at Kobe, and again as they tried to escape. For this crime I disembowel myself, and I beg you who are present to do me the honor of witnessing the act. Bowing once more, the speaker allowed his upper garments to slip down to his girdle, and remained naked to the waist. Carefully, according to custom, he tucked his sleeve under his knees to prevent himself from falling backward, for a noble Japanese gentleman should die falling forwards. Deliberately, with a steady hand, he took the dirk that lay before him. He looked at it wistfully, almost affectionately. For a moment he seemed to collect his thoughts for the last time, and then, stepping himself deeply below the waist in the left-hand side, he drew the dirk slowly across to his right side, and turning it in the wound, gave a slight cut upwards. During this sickeningly painful operation, he never moved a muscle of his face. When he drew out the dirk, he leaned forward and stretched out his neck. An expression of pain for the first time crossed his face, but he uttered no sound. At that moment the kaishaku, who, still crouching by his side, had been keenly watching his every movement, sprang to his feet, poised his sword for a second in the air. There was a flash, a heavy, ugly thud, a crashing fall. With one blow the head had been severed from the body. A dead silence followed, broken only by the hideous noise of the blood throbbing out of the inert head before us which but a moment before had been a brave and chivalrous man. It was horrible. The kaishaku made a low bow, wiped his sword with a piece of paper which he had ready for the purpose, and retired from the raised floor, and the stained dirk was solemnly borne away, a bloody proof of the execution. The two representatives of the mikado then left their places, and crossing over to where the foreign witnesses sat, called to us to witness that the sentence of death upon Taki Sensaburo had been faithfully carried out. The ceremony being at an end, we left the temple. I might multiply any number of descriptions of seppuku from literature or from the relation of eyewitnesses, but one more instance will suffice. Two brothers, Sakon and Naiki, respectively twenty-four and seventeen years of age, made an effort to kill Ieyasu in order to avenge their father's wrongs, but before they could enter the camp they were made prisoners. The old general admired the pluck of the youths who dared an attempt on his knife, and ordered that they should be allowed to die an honorable death. Their little brother Hachimaro, a mere infant of eight summers, was condemned to a similar fate, as the sentence was pronounced on all the male members of the family, and the three were taken to a monastery where it was to be executed. A physician who was present on the occasion has left us a diary from which the following scene is translated. When they were all seated in a row for final dispatch, Sakon turned to the youngest and said, Go thou first, for I wish to be sure that thou dost it aright. Upon the little one's replying that, as he had never seen seppuku performed, he would like to see his brothers do it, and then he could follow them, the older brothers smiled between their tears. Well said, little fellow. 
so canst thou well boast of being our father's child. When they had placed him between them, Sakon thrust the dagger into the left side of his own abdomen and asked, Look, brother, dost understand now? Only don't push the dagger too far, lest thou fall back. Lean forward, rather, and keep thy knees well composed. Nike did likewise, and said to the boy, Keep thy eyes open, or else thou mayst look like a dying woman. If thy dagger feels anything within, and thy strength fails, take courage, and double thy effort to cut across. The child looked from one to the other, and when both had expired, he calmly half denuded himself, and followed the examples set him on either hand. The glorification of seppuku offered, naturally enough, no small temptation to its unwarranted committal. For causes entirely incompatible with reason, or for reasons entirely undeserving of death, hot-headed youths rushed into it as insects fly into fire. Mixed and dubious motives drove more samurai to this deed than nuns into convent gates. Life was cheap, cheap as reckoned by the popular standard of honor. The saddest feature was that honor, which was always in the agio, so to speak, was not always solid gold, but alloyed with baser metals. No one circle in the inferno will boast of greater density of Japanese population than the seventh, to which Dante consigns all victims of self-destruction. And yet, for a true samurai to hasten death or to court it was alike cowardice. A typical fighter, when he lost battle after battle, and was pursued from plain to hill, and from bush to cavern, found himself hungry and alone in the dark hollow of a tree, his sword blunt with use, his bow broken and arrows exhausted. Did not the noblest of the Romans fall upon his own sword in Philippi under like circumstances? Deemed it cowardly to die, but with a fortitude approaching a Christian martyr's, cheered himself with an impromptu verse. Come, evermore come, ye dread sorrows and pains, and heap on my burdened back, that I not one test my lack of what strength in me remains. This, then, was the Bushido teaching. Bear and face all calamities and adversities with patience and a pure conscience, for as Mencius thought, when heaven is about to confer a great office on any one, it first exercises his mind with suffering, and his sinews and bones with toil. It exposes his body to hunger and subjects him to extreme poverty, and it confounds his undertakings. In all these ways it stimulates his mind, hardens his nature, and supplies his incompetencies. True honor lies in fulfilling heaven's decree, and no death incurred in so doing is ignominious, whereas death to avoid what heaven has in store is cowardly indeed. In that quaint book of Sir Thomas Brown's Religio Medici, there is an exact English equivalent for what is repeatedly taught in our precepts. Let me quote it. It is a brave act of valor to condemn death, but where life is more terrible than death, it is then the truest valor to dare to live. A renowned priest of the seventeenth century satirically observed, Talk as he may, a samurai who ne'er has died is apt in decisive moments to flee or hide. Again, him who once has died in the bottom of his breast, no spears of Sanada, nor all the arrows of Tametomo can pierce. How near we come to the portals of the temple, whose builder taught, He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. These are but a few of the numerous examples which tend to confirm the moral identity of the human species, notwithstanding an attempt so assiduously made to render the distinction between Christian and pagan as great as possible. We have thus seen that the Bushido institution of suicide was neither so irrational nor barbarous as its abuse strikes us at first sight. We will now see whether its sister institution of redress, or call it revenge, if you will, has its mitigating features. I hope I can dispose of this question in a few words, 
since a similar institution, or call it custom if that suits you better, has at some time prevailed among all people and has not yet become entirely obsolete as attested by the continuance of dueling and lynching. Why has not an American captain recently challenged Esterhazy that the wrongs of Dreyfus be avenged? Among a savage tribe which has no marriage, adultery is not a sin, and only the jealousy of a lover protects a woman from abuse. So in a time which has no criminal court, murder is not a crime, and only the vigilant vengeance of the victim's people preserves social order. What is the most beautiful thing on earth? said Osiris to Horus. The reply was, to avenge a parent's wrongs to which a Japanese would have added, and a master's. In revenge there is something which satisfies one's sense of justice. The avenger reasons, My good father did not deserve death. He who killed him did great evil. My father, if he were alive, would not tolerate a deed like this. Heaven itself hates wrongdoing. It is the will of my father, it is the will of heaven, that the evildoer cease from his work. He must perish by my hand, because he shed my father's blood. I, who am his flesh and blood, must shed the murderers. The same heaven shall not shelter him and me. The ratiocination is simple and childish, though we know Hamlet did not reason much more deeply. Nevertheless, it shows an innate sense of exact balance and equal justice. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Our sense of revenge is as exact as our mathematical faculty, and until both terms of the equation are satisfied, we cannot get over the sense of something left undone. In Judaism, which believed in a jealous God, or in Greek mythology, which provided a nemesis, Vengeance may be left to superhuman agencies, but common sense furnished Bushido with the institution of redress as a kind of ethical court of equity, where people could take cases not to be judged in accordance with ordinary law. The master of the forty-seven ronins was condemned to death. He had no court of higher instance to appeal to. His faithful retainers addressed themselves to vengeance, the only supreme court existing, they in their turn were condemned by common law but the popular instinct passed a different judgment and hence their memory is still kept as green and fragrant as are their graves at sengakuji to this day though lao tse taught to recompense injury with kindness the voice of confucius was very much louder which counseled that injury must be recompensed with justice and yet revenge was justified only when it was undertaken in behalf of our superiors and benefactors. One's own wrongs, including injuries done to wife and children, were to be borne and forgiven. A samurai could therefore fully sympathize with Hannibal's oath to avenge his country's wrongs, but he scorns James Hamilton for wearing in his girdle a handful of earth from his wife's grave as an eternal incentive to avenge her wrongs on the regent Murray. Both of these institutions of suicide and redress lost their raison d'être at the promulgation of the criminal code. No more do we hear of romantic adventures of a fair maiden as she tracks in disguise the murderer of her parent. No more can we witness tragedies of family vendetta enacted. The knight errantry of Miyamoto Musashi is now a tale of the past. The well-ordered police spies out the criminal for the injured party, and the law meets out justice. The whole state and society will see that wrong is righted. The sense of justice satisfied, there is no need of kataki uchi. If this had meant that hunger of the heart, which feeds upon the hope of glutting that hunger with the life-blood of the victim, as a New England divine has described it, a few paragraphs in the criminal code would not so entirely have made an end of it. As to seppuku, though it too has no existence de jure, we still hear of it from time to time, and shall continue to hear, I am afraid, as long as the past is remembered. 
Many painless and time-saving methods of self-immolation will come in vogue, as its votaries are increasing with fearful rapidity throughout the world. But Professor Morselli will have to concede to seppuku an aristocratic position among them. He maintains that, when suicide is accomplished by very painful means or at the cost of prolonged agony, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, it may be assigned as the act of a mind distorted by fanaticism, by madness, or by morbid excitement. But a normal seppuku does not savor of fanaticism, or madness, or excitement. Utmost sang-froid being necessary to its successful accomplishment. Of the two kinds into which Dr. Strahan divides suicide, the rational or quasi, and the irrational or true, seppuku is the best example of the former type. End of chapter 12《Nine, Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Thirteen, The Sword, the Soul of the Samurai. From these bloody institutions, as well as from the general tenor of Bushido, it is easy to infer that the sword played an important part in social discipline and life. The saying passed as an axiom which called the sword the soul of the samurai, and made it the emblem of power and prowess. When Mahomet proclaimed that the sword is the key of heaven and of hell, he only echoed a Japanese sentiment. Very early the samurai boy learned to wield it. It was a momentous occasion for him when at the age of five he was apparelled in the paraphernalia of samurai costume, placed upon a go-board and initiated into the rites of the military profession by having thrust into his girdle a real sword instead of the toy dirk with which he had been playing. After this first ceremony of adoptio per arma, he was no more to be seen outside his father's gates without this badge of his status, even if it was usually substituted for everyday wear by a gilded wooden dirk. Not many years pass before he wears constantly the genuine steel, though blunt, and then the sham arms are thrown aside, and with enjoyment keener than his newly acquired blades, he marches out to try their edge on wood and stone. When he reaches man's estate at the age of fifteen, being given independence of action, he can now pride himself upon the possession of arms sharp enough for any work. The very possession of the dangerous instrument imparts to him a feeling and an air of self-respect and responsibility. He bears not his sword in vain. What he carries in his belt is a symbol of what he carries in his mind and heart, loyalty and honor. The two swords, the longer and the shorter, called respectively Daito and Shoto, or Katana and Wakitashi, never leave his side. When at home, they grace the most conspicuous place in study or parlor. By night, they guard his pillow within easy reach of his hand. Constant companions, they are beloved, and proper names of endearment given them. Being venerated, they are well-nigh worshipped. The father of history has recorded as a curious piece of information that the Scythians sacrifice to an iron scimitar. Many a temple and many a family in Japan hoards a sword as an object of adoration. Even the commonest dirk has due respect paid to it. Any insult to it is tantamount to personal affront. Woe to him who carelessly steps over a weapon lying on the floor! So precious an object cannot long escape the notice and the skill of artists, nor the vanity of its owner, especially in times of peace, when it is worn with no more use than a crozier by a bishop or a scepter by a king. Shark skin and finest silk for hilt, silver and gold for guard, lacquer of varied hues for scabbard, rob the deadliest weapon of half its terror. 
but these appurtenances are playthings compared with the blade itself. The swordsmith was not a mere artisan, but an inspired artist, and his workshop a sanctuary. Daily he commenced his craft with prayer and purification, or, as the phrase was, he committed his soul and spirit into the forging and tempering of the steel. Every swing of the sledge, every plunge into water, every friction on the grindstone, was a religious act of no slight import. Was it the spirit of the master or of his tutelary god that cast a formidable spell over our sword? Perfect as a work of art, setting at defiance its Toledo and Damascus rivals, there is more than art could impart. Its cold blade, collecting on its surface, the moment it is drawn, the vapors of the atmosphere. Its immaculate texture, flashing light of bluish hue, its matchless edge upon which histories and possibilities hang the curve of its back uniting exquisite grace with utmost strength all these thrill us with mixed feelings of power and beauty of awe and terror harmless were its mission if it only remained a thing of beauty and joy but ever within reach of the hand it presented no small temptation for abuse too often did the blade flash forth from its peaceful sheath. The abuse sometimes went so far as to try the acquired steel on some harmless creature's neck. The question that concerns us most is, however, did Bushido justify the promiscuous use of the weapon? The answer is unequivocally no. As it laid great stress on its proper use, so did it denounce and abhor its misuse. A dastard or a braggart was he who brandished his weapon on undeserved occasions. A self-possessed man knows the right time to use it, and such times come but rarely. Let us listen to the great Count Katsu, who passed through one of the most turbulent times of our history, when assassinations, suicides, and other sanguinary practices were the order of the day. Endowed as he once was with almost dictatorial powers, repeatedly marked out as an object for assassination, he never tarnished his sword with blood. In relating some of his reminiscences to a friend, he says, in a quaint plebeian way peculiar to him, I have a great dislike for killing people, and so I haven't killed one single man. I have released those whose heads should have been chopped off. A friend said to me one day, You don't kill enough. Don't you eat pepper and egg plants? Well, some people are no better. But you see that fellow was slain himself. My escape may be due to my dislike of killing. I had the hilt of my sword so tightly fastened to the scabbard that it was hard to draw the blade. I made up my mind that though they cut me, I will not cut. Yes, yes, some people are truly like fleas and mosquitoes, and they bite, but what does their biting amount to? It itches a little, that's all. It won't endanger life. These are the words of one whose Bushido training was tried in the fiery furnace of adversity and triumph. The popular apothegm, to be beaten is to conquer, meaning true conquest consists in not opposing a riotous foe, and the best one victory is that obtained without shedding of blood, and others of similar import, will show that after all the ultimate ideal of knighthood was peace. It was a great pity that this high ideal was left exclusively to priests and moralists to preach, while the samurai went on practicing and extolling martial traits. In this they went so far as to tinge the ideals of womanhood with Amazonian character. Here we may profitably devote a few paragraphs to the subject of the training and position of woman. End of chapter 13「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 14 the training and position of woman. 
the female half of our species has sometimes been called the paragon of paradoxes because the intuitive working of its mind is beyond the comprehension of men's arithmetical understanding the chinese ideogram denoting the mysterious the unknowable consists of two parts one meaning young and the other woman because the physical charms and delicate thoughts of the fair sex are above the coarse mental caliber of our sex to explain in the bushido ideal of woman however there is little mystery and only a seeming paradox i have said that it was amazonian but that is only half the truth ideographically the chinese represent wife by a woman holding a broom certainly not to brandish it offensively or defensively against her conjugal ally neither for witchcraft but for the more harmless uses of which the besom was first invented the idea involved being thus not less homely than the etymological derivation of the english wife weaver and daughter duhitar milkmaid without confining the sphere of women's activity to küche kirche kinder as the present german kaiser is said to do the bushido ideal of womanhood was pre-eminently domestic these seeming contradictions domesticity and amazonian traits are not inconsistent with the precepts of knighthood as we shall see bushido being a teaching primarily intended for the masculine sex the virtues it prized in woman were naturally far from being distinctly feminine winkelmann remarks that the supreme beauty of greek art is rather male than female and lecky adds that it was true in the moral conception of the greeks as in their art Bushido similarly praised those women most who emancipated themselves from the frailty of their sex and displayed a heroic fortitude worthy of the strongest and the bravest of men. Young girls, therefore, were trained to repress their feelings, to indurate their nerves, to manipulate weapons, especially the long-handled sword called naginata, so as to be able to hold their own against unexpected odds yet the primary motive for exercises of this martial character was not for use in the field it was twofold personal and domestic woman owning no caesarean of her own formed her own bodyguard with her weapon she guarded her personal sanctity with as much zeal as her husband did his masters the domestic utility of her warlike training was in the education of her sons as we shall see later fencing and similar exercises if rarely of practical use were a wholesome counterbalance to the otherwise sedentary habits of woman but these exercises were not followed only for hygienic purposes they could be turned into use in times of need girls when they reached womanhood were presented with dirks kaiken pocket poniards which might be directed to the bosom of their assailants or if advisable to their own the latter was very often the case and yet i will not judge them severely even the christian conscience with its horror of self-immolation will not be harsh with them seeing pelagia and domnia two suicides were canonized for their purity and piety when a japanese virginia saw her chastity menaced she did not wait for her father's dagger her own weapon lay always in her bosom it was a disgrace to her not to know the proper way in which she had to perpetrate self-destruction for example little as she was taught in anatomy she must know the exact spot to cut in her throat she must know how to tie her lower limbs together with a belt so that whatever the agonies of death might be her corpse be found in utmost modesty with the limbs properly composed is not a caution like this worthy of the christian perpetua or the vestal cornelia i would not put such an abrupt interrogation were it not for a misconception based on our bathing customs and other trifles that chastity is unknown among us on the contrary chastity was the pre-eminent virtue of the samurai woman held above life itself 
A young woman, taken prisoner, seeing herself in danger of violence at the hands of the rough soldiery, says she will obey their pleasure, provided she be first allowed to write a line to her sisters, whom war has dispersed in every direction. When the epistle is finished, off she runs to the nearest well and saves her honor by drowning. The letter she leaves behind ends with these verses. For fear lest clouds may dim her light, should she but graze this nether sphere, the young moon poised above the height doth hastily be take to flight. It would be unfair to give my readers an idea that masculinity alone was our highest ideal for woman. Far from it! Accomplishments and the gentler graces of life were required of them. Music, dancing, and literature were not neglected. Some of the finest verses in our literature were expressions of feminine sentiments. In fact, women played an important role in the history of Japanese belles lettres. Dancing was taught. I am speaking of samurai girls and not of geisha, only to smooth the angularity of their movements. Music was to regale the weary hours of their fathers and husbands. Hence, it was not for the technique, the art as such, that music was learned for the ultimate object was purification of heart, since it was said that no harmony of sound is attainable without the player's heart being in harmony with herself. Here again we see the same idea prevailing which we notice in the training of youths, that accomplishments were ever kept subservient to moral worth. Just enough of music and dancing to add grace and brightness to life, but never to foster vanity and extravagance. I sympathize with the Persian prince who, when taken into a ballroom in London and asked to take part in the merriment, bluntly remarked that in his country they provided a particular set of girls to do that kind of business for them. The accomplishments of our women were not acquired for show or social ascendancy. They were a home diversion, and if they shone in social parties, it was as the attributes of a hostess in other words, as a part of the household contrivance for hospitality. Domesticity guided their education. It may be said that the accomplishments of the women of old Japan, be they martial or pacific in character, were mainly intended for the home, and however far they might roam, they never lost sight of the hearth as the center. It was to maintain its honor and integrity that they slaved, drudged, and gave up their lives. Night and day, in tones at once firm and tender, brave and plaintive, they sang to their little nests. As daughter, woman sacrificed herself for her father, as wife for her husband, and as mother for her son. Thus, from earliest youth, she was taught to deny herself. Her life was not one of independence, but of dependent service. Men's help meet. If her presence is helpful, she stays on the stage with him. If it hinders his work, she retires behind the curtain. Not infrequently does it happen that the youth becomes enamored of a maiden who returns his love with equal ardor, but when she realizes that his interest in her makes him forgetful of his duties, disfigures her person that her attractions may cease. Azuma, the ideal wife in the minds of samurai girls, finds herself loved by a man who, in order to win her affection, conspires against her husband. Upon pretense of joining in the guilty plot, she manages in the dark to take her husband's place and the sword of the lover-assassin descends upon her own devoted head. The following epistle, written by the wife of a young daimyo, before taking her own life, needs no comment. Oft have I heard that no accident or chance ever mars the march of events here below, and that all moves in accordance with a plan. To take shelter under a common bow or a drink of the same river is alike ordained from ages prior to our birth. Since we were joined in ties of eternal wedlock, now two short years ago, my heart hath followed thee, even as its shadow followeth an object, inseparately bound heart to heart, loving and being loved. Learning but recently, however, that the coming battle is to be the last of thy labor and life, 
take the farewell greeting of thy loving partner. I have heard that Ko Wu, the mighty warrior of ancient China, lost a battle, loth to part with his favorite Gu. Yoshinaka, too, brave as he was, brought disaster to his cause, too weak to bid prompt farewell to his wife. Why should I, to whom earth no longer offers hope or joy, why should I detain thee or thy thoughts by living? Why should I not, rather, await thee on the road which all mortal kind must sometime tread? Never, prithee, never forget the many benefits which our good master Hideyori hath heaped upon thee. The gratitude we owe him is as deep as the sea and as high as the hills. Woman's surrender of herself to the good of her husband, home, and family was as willing and honorable as the man's self-surrender to the good of his lord and country. Self-renunciation, without which no life enigma can be solved, was the keynote of the loyalty of man as well as of the domesticity of woman. She was no more the slave of man than was her husband of his liege lord, and the part she played was recognized as Nigel, the inner help. In the ascending scale of service stood woman, who annihilated herself for man, that he might annihilate himself for the master, that he in turn might obey heaven. I know the weakness of this teaching, and that the superiority of Christianity is nowhere more manifest than here, and that it requires of each and every living soul direct responsibility to its creator. Nevertheless, as far as the doctrine of service— the serving of a cause higher than one's own self, even at the sacrifice of one's individuality. I say the doctrine of service, which is the greatest that Christ preached, and is the sacred keynote of his mission. As far as that is concerned, Bushido is based on eternal truth. My readers will not accuse me of undue prejudice in favor of slavish surrender of volition. I accept in a large measure the view advanced with breadth of learning and defended with profundity of thought by Hegel, that history is the unfolding and realization of freedom. The point I wish to make is that the whole teaching of Bushido was so thoroughly imbued with the spirit of self-sacrifice that it was required not only of woman but of man. Hence, until the influence of its precepts is entirely done away with, our society will not realize the view rashly expressed by an American exponent of women's rights, who exclaimed, May all the daughters of Japan rise in revolt against ancient customs! Can such a revolt succeed? Will it improve the female status? Will the rights they gain by such a summary process repay the loss of that sweetness of disposition, that gentleness of manner, which are their present heritage? Was not the loss of domesticity on the part of Roman matrons, followed by moral corruption, too gross to mention? Can the American reformer assure us that a revolt of our daughters is the true course for their historical development to take? These are grave questions. Changes must and will come without revolts. In the meantime, let us see whether the status of the fair sex under the Bushido regimen was really so bad as to justify a revolt. We hear much of the outward respect European knights paid to God and the ladies, the incongruity of the two terms making Gibbon blush. We are also told by Hallam that the morality of chivalry was coarse, that gallantry implied illicit love. The effect of chivalry on the weaker vessel was food for reflection on the part of philosophers, M. Guizot contending that feudalism and chivalry wrought wholesome influences, while Mr. Spencer tells us that in a militant society, and what is feudal society if not militant, the position of woman is necessarily low, improving only as society becomes more industrial. Now, is M. Guizot's theory true of Japan, or is Mr. Spencer's? In reply I might aver that both are right. The military class in Japan was restricted to the samurai, comprising nearly two million souls. Above them were the military nobles, the daimyo, and the court nobles, the kuge, these higher, sybaritical nobles being fighters only in name. 
Below them were masses of the common people, mechanics, tradesmen, and peasants, whose life was devoted to arts of peace. Thus, what Herbert Spencer gives as the characteristics of a militant type of society may be said to have been exclusively confined to the samurai class, while those of the industrial type were applicable to the classes above and below it. This is well illustrated by the position of woman, for in no class did she experience less freedom than among the samurai. Strange to say, the lower the social class, as for instance among small artisans, the more equal was the position of husband and wife. Among the higher nobility, too, the difference in the relations of the sexes was less marked, chiefly because there were few occasions to bring the differences of sex into prominence, the leisurely nobleman having become literally effeminate. Thus, Spencer's dictum was fully exemplified in old Japan. As to Guizot's, those who read his presentation of a feudal community will remember that he had the higher nobility especially under consideration, so that his generalization applies to the daimyo and the kuge. I shall be guilty of gross injustice to historical truth if my words give one a very low opinion of the status of woman under Bushido. I do not hesitate to state that she was not treated as man's equal, but until we learn to discriminate between difference and inequalities, there will always be misunderstandings upon this subject. When we think in how few respects men are equal among themselves, that is, before law courts or voting polls, it seems idle to trouble ourselves with a discussion of the equality of sexes. When the American Declaration of Independence said that all men were created equal, it had no reference to their mental or physical gifts. It simply repeated what Ulpian long ago announced, that before the law all men are equal. Legal rights were in this case the measure of their equality. Were the law the only scale by which to measure the position of woman in a community, it would be as easy to tell where she stands as to give her avoir du poids in pounds and ounces. But the question is, is there a correct standard in comparing the relative social position of the sexes? Is it right, is it enough, to compare women's status to men's as the value of silver is compared with that of gold, and give the ratio numerically? Such a method of calculation excludes from consideration the most important kind of value which a human being possesses, namely the intrinsic. In view of the manifold variety of requisites for making each sex fulfill its earthly mission, the standard to be adopted in measuring its relative position must be of a composite character, or, to borrow from economic language, it must be a multiple standard. Bushido had a standard of its own, and it was binomial. It tried to gauge the value of woman on the battlefield and by the hearth. There she counted for very little, here for all. The treatment accorded her corresponded to this double measurement, as a social-political unit not much, while as wife and mother she received highest respect and deepest affection. Why among so military a nation as the Romans were their matrons so highly venerated? Was it not because they were matrona, mothers? Not as fighters or lawgivers, but as their mothers did men bow before them. So with us. While fathers and husbands were absent in field or camp, the government of the household was left entirely in the hands of mothers and wives. The education of the young, even their defense, was entrusted to them. The warlike exercises of women, of which I have spoken, were primarily to enable them intelligently to direct and follow the education of their children. I have noticed a rather superficial notion prevailing among half-informed foreigners that because the common Japanese expression for one's wife is, my rustic wife, and the like, she is despised and held in little esteem. When it is told that such phrases as, my foolish father, my swinish son, my awkward self, etc., are in current use, is not the answer clear enough? To me it seems that our idea of marital union goes in some ways further than the so-called Christian. 
Man and woman shall be one flesh. The individualism of the Anglo-Saxon cannot let go of the idea that husband and wife are two persons. Hence, when they disagree, their separate rights are recognized, and when they agree, they exhaust their vocabulary in all sorts of silly pet names and nonsensical blandishments. It sounds highly irrational to our ears when a husband or wife speaks to a third party of his other half, better or worse, as being lovely, bright, kind, and what not. Is it good taste to speak of oneself as my bright self, my lovely disposition, and so forth? We think praising one's own wife or one's own husband is praising a part of one's own self, and self-praise is regarded, to say the least, as bad taste among us, and I hope among Christian nations too. I have diverged at some length because the polite debasement of one's consort was a usage most in vogue among the samurai. The Teutonic races, beginning their tribal life with a superstitious awe of the fair sex, though this is really wearing off in Germany, and the Americans beginning their social life under the painful consciousness of the numerical insufficiency of women, who, now increasing, are, I am afraid, fast losing the prestige their colonial mothers enjoyed. The respect man pays to woman has in Western civilization become the chief standard of morality. But in the martial ethics of Bushido, the main watershed dividing the good and the bad was sought elsewhere. It was located along the line of duty, which bound man to his own divine soul and then to other souls, in the five relations I have mentioned in the early part of this paper. Of these we have brought to our readers notice loyalty, the relation between one man as vassal and another as lord. Upon the rest I have only dwelt incidentally, as occasion presented itself, because they were not peculiar to Bushido. Being founded on natural affections, they could but be common to all mankind, though in some particulars they may have been accentuated by conditions which its teachings induced. In this connection there comes before me the peculiar strength and tenderness of friendship between man and man, which often added to the bond of brotherhood a romantic attachment doubtless intensified by the separation of the sexes in youth a separation which denied to affection the natural channel open to it in western chivalry or in the free intercourse of anglo-saxon lands i might fill pages with japanese versions of the story of daemon and pythias or achilles and patroclos or tell in bushido parlance of ties as sympathetic as those which bound david and jonathan End of chapter fourteen Bushido, The Soul of Japan, by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 15. The Influence of Bushido It is not surprising, however, that the virtues and teachings unique in the precepts of knighthood did not remain circumscribed to the military class. This makes us hasten to the consideration of the influence of Bushido on the nation at large. We have brought into view only a few of the more prominent peaks which rise above the range of knightly virtues, in themselves so much more elevated than the general level of our national life. As the sun in its rising first tips the highest peaks with russet hue, and then gradually casts its rays on the valley below, so the ethical system which first enlightened the military order drew in course of time followers from amongst the masses. Democracy raises up a natural prince for its leader, and aristocracy infuses a princely spirit among the people. Virtues are no less contagious than vices. There needs but one wise man in a company, and all are wise. So rapid is the contagion, says Emerson. No social class or caste can resist the diffusive power of moral influence. Prate as we may of the triumphant march of Anglo-Saxon liberty, rarely has it received impetus from the masses. Was it not rather the work of the squires and gentlemen? Very truly does Monsieur Taine say, 
these three syllables as used across the channel summarize the history of english society democracy may make self-confident retorts to such a statement and fling back the question when adam delft and eve span where then was the gentleman all the more pity that the gentleman was not present in eden the first parents missed him sorely and paid a high price for his absence had he been there not only would the garden have been more tastefully dressed but they would have learned without painful experience that disobedience to jehovah was disloyalty and dishonor treason and rebellion what japan was she owed to the samurai they were not only the flower of the nation but its root as well all the gracious gifts of heaven flowed through them though they kept themselves socially aloof from the populace they set a moral standard for them and guided them by their example i admit bushido has its esoteric and exoteric teachings these were eudaimonistic looking after the welfare and happiness of the commonality while those were aretaic emphasizing the practice of virtues for their own sake in the most chivalrous days of europe knights formed numerically but a small fraction of the population but as emerson says in english literature half the drama and all the novels from sir philip sidney to sir walter scott paint this figure gentlemen right in place of sidney and scott chikamatsu and bakin and you have in a nutshell the main features of the literary history of japan the innumerable avenues of popular amusement and instruction the theatres the storytellers booths the preachers days the musical recitations the novels have taken for their chief theme the stories of the samurai the peasants round the open fire in their huts never tire of repeating the achievements of yoshitsune and his faithful retainer benkei or of the two brave soga brothers the dusky urchins listen with gaping mouths until the last stick burns out and the fire dies in its embers still leaving their hearts aglow with the tale that is told the clerks and the shop boys after their day's work is over and the amado outside shutters of the store are closed gather together to relate the story of nobunaga and hideyoshi far into the night until slumber overtakes their weary eyes and transports them from the drudgery of the counter to the exploits of the field the very babe just beginning to toddle is taught to lisp the adventures of momotaro the daring conqueror of ogreland even girls are so imbued with the love of knightly deeds and virtues that like desdemona they would seriously incline to devour with greedy ear the romance of the samurai the samurai grew to be the beau ideal of the whole race as among flowers the cherry is queen so among men the samurai is lord so sang the populace debarred from commercial pursuits the military class itself did not aid commerce but there was no channel of human activity no avenue of thought which did not receive in some measure an impetus from bushido intellectual and moral japan was directly or indirectly the work of knighthood mr mallock in his exceedingly suggestive book aristocracy and evolution has eloquently told us that social evolution in so far as it is other than biological may be defined as the unintended result of the intentions of great men further that historical progress is produced by a struggle not among the community generally to live but a struggle amongst a small section of the community to lead to direct to employ the majority in the best way whatever may be said about the soundness of this argument these statements are amply verified in the part played by bushi in the social progress as far as it went of our empire how the spirit of bushido permitted all social classes is also shown in the development of a certain order of men known as otokodatte the natural leaders of democracy staunch fellows were they every inch of them strong with the strength of massive manhood 
at once the spokesmen and the guardians of popular rights they had a following of hundreds and thousands of souls who proffered in the same fashion that samurai did to daimyo the willing service of limb and life of body chattels and earthly honour backed by a vast multitude of rash and impetuous working men those born bosses from the formidable check to the rampacy of the two-sworded order in manifold ways has Bushido filtered down from the social class where it originated and acted as leaven among the masses, furnishing a moral standard for the whole people. The precepts of knighthood, begun at first as the glory of the elite, became in time an aspiration and inspiration to the nation at large. And though the populace could not attain the moral height of those loftier souls, Yet Yamato Damishi, the soul of Japan, ultimately came to express the forksgeist of the island realm. If religion is no more than morality touched by emotion, as Matthew Arnold defines it, few ethical systems are better entitled to the rank of religion than Bushido. Motori has put the mute utterance of the nation into words when he sings, Isles of blessed Japan, should your Yamato spirit stranger seek to scan, say, scanting morn sunlit air blows the cherry wild and fair. Yes, the Sakura has for ages been the favorite of our people and the emblem of our character. Mark particularly the terms of definition which the poet uses, the words, the wild cherry flowers scenting the morning sun. The Yamato spirit is not a tame, tender plant, but a wild, in the sense of natural, growth. It is indigenous to the soil, its accidental qualities it may share with the flowers of other lands, but in its essence it remains the original, spontaneous outgrowth of our clime. But its nativity is not its sole claim to our affection. The refinement and grace of its beauty appeal to our aesthetic sense as no other flower can. We cannot share the admiration of the Europeans for their roses, which lack the simplicity of our flower. Then, too, the thorns that are hidden beneath the sweetness of the rose, the tenacity with which she clings to life as though loth or afraid to die rather than drop untimely, preferring to rot on her stem, her showy colors and heavy odors, all these are traits so unlike our flower, which carries no dagger or poison under its beauty, which is ever ready to depart life at the call of nature, whose colors are never gorgeous and whose light fragrance never palls. Beauty of color and of form is limited in its showing, it is a fixed quality of existence, whereas fragrance is volatile, ethereal as the breathing of life. So in all religious ceremonies, frankincense and myrrh play a prominent part. There is something spiritual in redolence. When the delicious perfume of the sakura quickens the morning air, as the sun in its course rises to illumine first the isles of the far east, few sensations are more serenely exhilarating than to inhale, as it were, the very breath of beauteous day. When the Creator himself is pictured as making new resolutions in his heart upon smelling a sweet savour, Genesis 8.21, is it any wonder that the sweet-smelling season of the cherry blossom should call forth the whole nation from their little habitations? Blame them not, if for a time their limbs forget their toil and moil, and their hearts their pangs and sorrows. Their brief pleasure ended, they return to their daily tasks with new strength and new resolutions. Thus, in ways more than one, is the sakura the flower of the nation. Is, then, this flower so sweet and evanescent, blown whithersoever the wind listeth, and shedding a puff of perfume ready to vanish forever, is this flower the type of the Yamato spirit? Is the soul of Japan so frail immortal? End of chapter 15「Bushido, the Soul of Japan » by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 16 – Is Bushido Still Alive? 
Is Bushido still alive, or has Western civilization, in its march through the land, already wiped out every trace of its ancient discipline? It were a sad thing if a nation's soul could die so fast. That were a poor soul that could succumb so easily to extraneous influences. The aggregate of psychological elements which constitute a national character is as tenacious as the irreducible elements of species, of the fins of fish, of the beak of the bird, of the tooth of the carnivorous animal. In his recent book, The Psychology of Peoples, full of shallow asseverations and brilliant generalizations, Monsieur Le Bon says, the discoveries due to the intelligence are the common patrimony of humanity. Qualities or defects of character constitute the exclusive patrimony of each people. They are the firm rock which the waters must wash day by day for centuries before they can wear away even its external asperities. These are strong words and would be highly worth pondering over, provided there were qualities and defects of character which constitute the exclusive patrimony of each people. Schematizing theories of this sort had been advanced long before Le Bon began to write his book, and they were exploded long ago by Theodore Weitz and Hugh Murray. In studying the various virtues instilled by Bushido, we have drawn upon European sources for comparison and illustrations, and we have seen that no one quality of character was its exclusive patrimony. It is true, the aggregate of moral qualities presents a quite unique aspect. It is this aggregate which Emerson names a compound result into which every great force enters as an ingredient. But, instead of making it, as Le Bon does, an exclusive patrimony of a race or people, the Concord philosopher calls it an element which unites the most forcible persons of every country, makes them intelligible and agreeable to each other, and is somewhat so precise that it is at once felt if an individual lack the Masonic sign. The character which Bushido stamped on our nation and on the samurai in particular cannot be said to form an irreducible element of species, but nevertheless, as to the vitality which it retains, there is no doubt. Were Bushido a mere physical force, the momentum it has gained in the last seven hundred years could not stop so abruptly. Were it transmitted only by heredity, its influence must be immensely widespread. Just think, as M. Chaison, a French economist, has calculated, that supposing there be three generations in a century, each of us would have in his veins the blood of at least twenty millions of the people living in the year 1000 Anno Domini. The merest peasant that grubs the soil, bowed by the weight of centuries, has in his veins the blood of ages, and is thus a brother to us as much as to the ox. An unconscious and irresistible power, Bushido has been moving the nation and individuals, it was an honest confession of the race when Yoshida Shoin, one of the most brilliant pioneers of modern Japan, wrote on the eve of his execution the following stanza. Full well I knew this course must end in death. It was Yamato's spirit urged me on to dare whatever be tied. Unformulated, Bushido was, and still is, the animating spirit, the motor force of our country. Mr. Ransom says that there are three distinct Japans in existence side by side today, the old, which has not wholly died out, the new, hardly yet born except in spirit, and the transition, passing now through its most critical throes. While this is very true in most respects, and particularly as regards tangible and concrete institutions, the statement as applied to fundamental ethical notions requires some modification, for Bushido, the maker and product of old Japan, is still the guiding principle of the transition and will prove the formative force of the new era. 
the great statesman who steered the ship of our state through the hurricane of the restoration and the whirlpool of national rejuvenation were men who knew no other moral teaching than the precepts of knighthood some writers have lately tried to prove that the christian missionaries contributed an appreciable quota to the making of new japan i would fain render honour to whom honour is due but this honour can hardly be accorded to the good missionaries more fitting it will be to their profession to stick to the scriptural injunction of, of preferring one another in honour than to advance a claim in which they have no proofs to back them for myself i believe that christian missionaries are doing great things for japan in the domain of education and especially of moral education only the mysterious though no the less certain working of the spirit is still hidden in divine secrecy whatever they do is still of indirect effect no as yet christian missionaries have effected but little visible in moulding the character of new japan no it was bushido pure and simple that urged us on for weal or woe open the biographies of the makers of modern japan of sakuma of saigo of okubo of kido not to mention the reminiscences of living men such as ito okuma itagaki etc and you will find that it was under the impetus of samuraihood that they thought and wrought when mr henry norman declared after his study and observation of the far east that only the respect in which japan differed from other oriental despotisms lay in the ruling influence among her people of the strictest loftiest and the most punctilious codes of honour that man has ever devised he touched the main spring which has made new japan what she is and which will make her what she is destined to be the transformation of japan is a fact patent to the whole world in a work of such magnitude various motives naturally entered but if one were to name the principal one would not hesitate to name bushido when we opened the whole country to foreign trade when we introduced the latest improvements in every department of life when we began to study western politics and sciences our guiding motive was not the development of our physical resources and the increase of wealth much less was it a blind imitation of western customs a close observer of oriental institutions and peoples has written we are told every day how europe has influenced japan and forget that the change in those islands was entirely self-generated that europeans did not teach japan but that japan of herself chose to learn from europe methods of organization civil and military which have so far proved successful she imported european mechanical science as the turks years before imported european artillery that is not exactly influence continues mr townsend unless indeed england is influenced by purchasing tea of china where is the european apostle asks our author or philosopher or statesman or agitator who has remade japan mr townsend has well perceived that the spring of action which brought about the changes in japan lay entirely within our own selves and if he had only probed into our psychology his keen powers of observation would easily have convinced him that that spring was no other than bushido the sense of honour which cannot bear being looked down upon as an inferior power that was the strongest of motives pecuniary or industrial considerations were awakened later in the process of transformation the influence of bushido is still so palpable that he who runs may read a glimpse into japanese life will make it manifest read hearn the most eloquent and truthful interpreter of the japanese mind and you see the working of that mind to be an example of the working of bushido the universal politeness of the people which is the legacy of knightly ways is too well known to be repeated anew the physical endurance fortitude and bravery that the little jap possesses 
were sufficiently proved in the China-Japanese war. Is there any nation more loyal and patriotic? Is a question asked by many, and for the proud answer, there is not. We must thank the precepts of knighthood. On the other hand, it is fair to recognize that for the very faults and defects of our character, Bushido is largely responsible. Our lack of abstruse philosophy, while some of our young men have already gained international reputation in scientific researches, not one has achieved anything in philosophical lines, is traceable to the neglect of metaphysical training under Bushido's regimen of education. Our sense of honor is responsible for our exaggerated sensitiveness and touchiness, and if there is the conceit in us with which some foreigners charge us, that, too, is a pathological outcome of honor. Have you seen in your tour of Japan many a young man with unkempt hair, dressed in shabbiest garb, carrying in his hand a large cane or a book, stalking about the streets with an air of utter indifference to mundane things? He is the Shosei, student, to whom the earth is too small and the heavens are not high enough. He has his own theories of the universe and of life. He dwells in castles of air and feeds on ethereal words of wisdom. In his eyes beams the fire of ambition. His mind is a thirst for knowledge. Penury is only a stimulus to drive him onward. Worldly goods are in his sight shackles to his character. He is the repository of loyalty and patriotism. He is the self-imposed guardian of national honor. With all his virtues and his faults, he is the last fragment of Bushido. Deep-rooted and powerful as is still the effect of Bushido, I have said that it is an unconscious and mute influence. The heart of the people responds, without knowing the reason why, to any appeal made to what it has inherited, and hence the same moral idea expressed in a newly translated term and in an old Bushido term has a vastly different degree of efficacy. A backsliding Christian, whom no pastoral persuasion could help from downward tendency, was reverted from his course by an appeal made to his loyalty, the fidelity he once swore to his master. The word loyalty revived all the noble sentiments that were permitted to grow lukewarm. A band of unruly youths engaged in a long-continued student's strike in a college on account of their dissatisfaction with a certain teacher disbanded the two simple questions put by the director. Is your professor a blameless character? If so, you ought to respect him and keep him in the school. Is he weak? If so, it is not manly to push a falling man. The scientific incapacity of the professor, which was the beginning of the trouble, dwindled into insignificance in comparison with the moral issues hinted at. By arousing the sentiments nurtured by Bushido, moral renovation of great magnitude can be accomplished. One cause of the failure of mission work is that most of the missionaries are, are grossly ignorant of our history. What do we care for heathen records, some say, and consequently estrange their religion from the habits of thought we and our forefathers have been accustomed to for centuries past. Mocking a nation's history, as though the career of any people, even the lowest African savages possessing no record, were not a page in the general history of mankind written by the hand of God himself. The very lost races are a palimpsest to be deciphered by a seeing eye. To a philosophic and pious mind, the races themselves are marks of divine chirography, clearly traced in black and white as on their skin. And if this simile holds good, the yellow race forms a precious page inscribed in hieroglyphics of gold. Ignoring the past career of a people, missionaries claim that Christianity is a new religion, whereas, to my mind, it is an old, old story which, if presented in intelligible words, that is to say, if expressed in the vocabulary familiar in the moral development of a people, will find easy lodgment in their hearts, irrespective of race or nationality. 
Christianity in its American or English form, with more of Anglo-Saxon freaks and fancies than grace and purity of its founder, is a pure scion to graft on Bushido's stock. Should the propagator of the new faith uproot the entire stock, root and branches, and plant the seeds of the gospel on the ravaged soil, such a heroic process may be possible. In Hawaii, where, it is alleged, the church militant had complete success in amassing spoils of wealth itself and in annihilating the aboriginal race, such a process is most decidedly impossible in Japan. Nay, it is a process which Jesus himself would never have employed in founding his kingdom on earth. It behooves us to take more to heart the following words of a saintly man, devout Christian and profound scholar. Men have divided the world into heathen and Christian, without considering how much good may have been hidden in the one, or how much evil may have been mingled with the other. They have compared the best part of themselves with the worst of their neighbors, the ideal of Christianity with the corruption of Greece or the East. They have not aimed at impartiality, but have been contented to accumulate all that could be said in praise of their own and in dispraise of other forms of religion. End of chapter 16「Bushido, the Soul of Japan」by Inazo Nitobe Chapter 17 The Future of Bushido But, whatever may be the error committed by individuals, there is little doubt that the fundamental principle of the religion they profess is a power which we must take into account in reckoning the future of Bushido, whose days seem to be already numbered. Ominous signs are in the air that betoken its future. Not only signs, but redoubtable forces are at work to threaten it. Few historical comparisons can be more judiciously made than between the chivalry of Europe and the Bushido of Japan, and if history repeats itself, it certainly will do with the fate of the latter what it did with that of the former. The particular and local causes for the decay of chivalry which Saint Palai gives have, of course, little application to Japanese conditions, but the larger and more general causes that helped to undermine knighthood and chivalry in and after the Middle Ages are as surely working for the decline of Bushido. One remarkable difference between the experience of Europe and of Japan is that whereas in Europe, when chivalry was weaned from feudalism and was adopted by the church, it obtained a fresh lease of life, in Japan no religion was large enough to nourish it. Hence, when the mother institution feudalism was gone, Bushido, left an orphan, had to shift for itself. The present elaborate military organization might take it under its patronage, but we know that modern warfare can afford little room for its continuous growth. Shintoism, which fostered it in its infancy, is itself superannuated. The hoary sages of ancient China are being supplanted by the intellectual parvenu of the type of Bentham and Mill. Moral theories of a comfortable kind, flattering to the chauvinistic tendencies of the time, and therefore thought well adapted to the need of this day, have been invented and propounded, but as yet we hear only their shrill voices echoing through the columns of yellow journalism. Principalities and powers are arrayed against the precepts of knighthood. Already, as Veblen says, the decay of the ceremonial code, or, as it is otherwise called, the vulgarization of life, among the industrial classes proper, has become one of the chief enormities of latter-day civilization in the eyes of all persons of delicate sensibilities. The irresistible tide of triumphant democracy, which can tolerate no form or shape of trust, and Bushido was a trust organized by those who monopolized reserve capital of intellect and culture, fixing the grades and value of moral qualities, is alone powerful enough to engulf the remnant of Bushido. 
the present societary forces are antagonistic to petty class spirit and chivalry is as freeman severely criticizes a class spirit modern society if it pretends to any unity cannot admit purely personal obligations devised in the interests of an exclusive class add to this the progress of popular instruction of industrial arts and habits of wealth and city life then we can easily see that neither the keenest cuts of samurai's swords nor the sharpest shafts shot from bushido's boldest bows can aught avail the state built upon the rock of honor and fortified by the same shall we call it the ehrenstaat or after the manner of carlyle the heroarchy is fast falling into the hands of quibbling lawyers and gibbering politicians armed with logic-chopping engines of war the words which a great thinker used in speaking of theresa and antigone may aptly be repeated of the samurai that the medium in which their ardent deeds took shape is forever gone alas for knightly virtues alas for samurai pride morality ushered into the world with the sound of bugles and drums is destined to fade away as the captains and the kings depart if history can teach us anything the state built on martial virtues be it a city like sparta or an empire like rome can never make on earth a continuing city universal and natural as is the fighting instinct in man fruitful as it has proved to be of noble sentiments and manly virtues it does not comprehend the whole man beneath the instinct to fight there lurks a diviner instinct to love we have seen that shintoism mencius and van yang ming have all clearly taught it but bushido and all other militant school of ethics engrossed doubtless with questions of immediate practical need too often forgot duly to emphasize this fact life has grown larger in these latter times callings nobler and broader than a warrior's claim our attention to-day with an enlarged view of life with the growth of democracy with better knowledge of other peoples and nations the confucian idea of benevolence there i also add the buddhist idea of pity will expand into the christian conception of love men have become more than subjects having grown to the estate of citizens nay they are more than citizens being men though war clouds hang heavy upon our horizon we will believe that the wings of the angel of peace can disperse them the history of the world confirms the prophecy that the meek shall inherit the earth a nation that sells its birthright of peace and backslides from the front rank of industrialism into the file of filibusterism makes a poor bargain indeed when the conditions of society are so changed that they have become not only adverse but hostile to bushido it is time for it to prepare for an honorable burial it is just as difficult to point out when chivalry dies as to determine the exact time of its inception dr miller says that chivalry was formally abolished in the year fifteen fifty nine when henry the second of france was slain in a tournament with us the edict formally abolishing feudalism in eighteen seventy was the signal to toll the knell of bushido the edict issued two years later prohibiting the wearing of swords rang out the old the unbought grace of life the cheap defence of nations the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise it rang in the new age of sophisters economists and calculators it has been said that japan won her late war with china by means of murata guns and krupp cannon it has been said the victory was the work of a modern school system but these are less than half-truths does ever a piano be it of the choicest workmanship of Eabar or steinway burst forth into the rhapsodies of liszt or the sonatas of beethoven without a master's hand or if guns win battles why did not louis napoleon beat the prussians with his mitrailleuse 
or the Spaniards with their Mausers, the Filipinos, whose arms were not better than the old-fashioned Remingtons. Needless to repeat what has grown a trite saying, that it is the spirit that quickeneth, without which the best of implements profiteth but little. The most improved guns and cannon do not shoot of their own accord. The most modern educational system does not make a coward a hero. No. What won the battles on the Yalu, in Korea and Manchuria, was the ghosts of our fathers, guiding our hands and beating in our hearts. They are not dead, those ghosts, the spirits of our warlike ancestors. To those who have eyes to see, they are clearly visible. Scratch a Japanese of the most advanced ideas, and he will show a samurai. The great inheritance of honor, of valor, and of all martial virtues is, as Professor Cramp very fitly expresses it, but ours on trust, the fief inalienable of the dead and of the generation to come, and the summons of the present is to guard this heritage, nor to bait one jot of the ancient spirit. The summons of the future will be so to widen its scope as to apply it in all walks and relations of life. It has been predicted, and predictions have been corroborated by the events of the last half-century, that the moral system of feudal Japan, like its castle and its armories, will crumble into dust, and new ethics rise phoenix-like to lead new Japan in her path of progress. Desirable and probable as the fulfillment of such a prophecy is, we must not forget that a phoenix rises only from its own ashes and that it is not a bird of passage, neither does it fly on pinions borrowed from other birds. The kingdom of God is within you. It does not come rolling down the mountains, however lofty. It does not come sailing across the seas, however broad. God has granted, says the Koran, to every people a prophet in its own tongue. The seeds of the kingdom, as vouched for and apprehended by the Japanese mind, blossomed in Bushido. Now its days are closing, sad to say, before its full fruition, and we turn in every direction for other sources of sweetness and light, of strength and comfort, but among them there is as yet nothing found to take its place. The profit and loss philosophy of utilitarians and materialists finds favor among logic choppers with half a soul. The only other ethical system which is powerful enough to cope with utilitarianism and materialism is Christianity, in comparison with which Bushido, it must be confessed, is like a dimly burning wick, which the Messiah was proclaimed not to quench but to fan into a flame. Like his Hebrew precursors, the prophets, notably Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, and Habakkuk, Bushido laid particular stress on the moral conduct of rulers and public men and of nations, whereas the ethics of Christ, which deal almost solely with individuals and his personal followers, will find more and more practical application as individualism, in its capacity of a moral factor, grows in potency. The domineering, self-assertive, so-called master morality of Nietzsche, itself akin in some respects to Bushido, is, if I am not greatly mistaken, a passing phase or temporary reaction against what he terms, by morbid distortion, the humble, self-denying slave morality of the Nazarene. Christianity and materialism, including utilitarianism, or will the future reduce them to still more archaic forms of Hebraism and Hellenism, will divide the world between them. Lesser systems of morals will ally themselves on either side for their preservation. On which side will Bushido enlist? Having no set dogma or formula to defend, it can afford to disappear as an entity. Like the cherry blossom, it is willing to die at the first gust of the morning breeze. But a total extinction will never be its lot. Who can say that stoicism is dead? It is dead as a system, but it is alive as a virtue. 
its energy and vitality are still felt through many channels of life in the philosophy of western nations in the jurisprudence of all the civilized world nay wherever man struggles to raise himself above himself wherever his spirit masters his flesh by his own exertions there we see the immortal discipline of zeno at work bushido as an independent code of ethics may vanish but its power will not perish from the earth its schools of martial prowess or civic honor may be demolished but its light and its glory will long survive their ruins like its symbolic flower after it is blown to the four winds it will still bless mankind with the perfume with which it will enrich life ages after when its customaries shall have been buried and its very name forgotten its odors will come floating in the air as from a far-off unseen hill the wayside gaze beyond then in the beautiful language of the quaker poet the traveller owns the grateful sense of sweetness near he knows not whence and pausing takes with forehead bare the benediction of the air end of chapter seventeen end of bushido the soul of japan thanks for listening